Today's episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. I've been an avid camper most of my life. And more that I actually lived in the Wyoming wilderness for almost two years as a child, in a house on a nature preserve. It was a place where electricity was only available by generator, and we had to boil water that me and my siblings carried up from the creek. All of this was before I was even ten years old, and if there were emergencies, it would be at least an hour before we could get to help or help could get to us. I've hunted dangerous game before as well, not particularly proud of it to be honest, but it happened, and also seen some weird stuff in the desert. So when I say that I will not venture into the woods of the Cascadia mountain range alone, it's important to know that the wilderness doesn't frighten me easily. So I was 23 years old when a friend of mine, his name was Darren, invited me to a camping trip. The site was a place a few miles up a logging road, so about an hour long hike from an already back road of a back road. It was just me, Darren, and his good friend Wade. The place was from the logging road about 10 minutes down a trail. The moment that we got to the site, I was excited. The small lake was beautiful, barely touched by people over the years. It also comforted me somewhat when we got there to see that within the last month, at least somebody else had camped out there, extra wood by the fire pit. We ate a bunch of chili and hot dogs, but around dusk the guys went off into the woods and they came back with a sealed bucket that they had buried the year before, and we opened it to get some of the MREs that we had stowed in their cache there. It was all in all looking to be one of the better camping trips that I've had in my adult life. That night though was a bit different. For the first time in my life I felt, I don't know, an uneasiness sleeping in my tent. I couldn't quite place it but chalked it up to just not being used to camping without my dad. Darren bought his 38 special for protection from predators but he was the only one armed. Anyway the next day it rained as it does in the PNW and we tried to wait it out but eventually called it quits, packed up and we just went home. But fast forward to the next year, me and Darren get the itch to go camping again and I wanted to give that site another shot. In fact, I spent a great deal of effort convincing a bunch of my friends to tag along. In the end, it wound up being six of us and a big white German shepherd. Me, Darren, Wade, James, Charles and Rita, James's girlfriend, and Moogie, the dog. Knowing about the uneasiness felt the last time though, I brought my 12 gauge this time. James wanted to get some unregulated target practice in as well, shooting stuff that they don't allow at official gun ranges like full cans and gallon jugs and stuff. We also brought a quad with us this time so that we could haul a bunch of extra water, booze and other supplies to make our weekend more comfortable. The first day though, as we're setting up, we hear a loudspeaker playing some music over by the south end of the lake, which was basically right next to the logging road and this could be seen from the road, unlike the year prior. So, deciding that we're just being, you know, Americans, me and James saunter down to meet the source of the noise pollution. Now, I have to commend the coolness of the cop that was just having a fishing trip, when two large armed men, me with the 12 gauge, James with his 308, emerged from the tree line. We introduced ourselves though, mentioned the others, but not exactly where we were camping just that it was nearby. And that was when stuff got creepy. It could have just been cops doing cop stuff, but this guy really wanted to know exactly where we were going to be. Then he mentioned his favorite spots nearby and really, really wanted us to try these other two spots more miles down the logging road. At that point, it was almost like... I don't know, he was suggesting that that was the only spot where we wouldn't be in trouble. Darren showed up finally though, told us that he spoke to the landowner several years ago and they were fine with us being there. And the cop was mad. 
but we lied and said that we'd check out the site that he was pushing. None of us trusted the guy when we left, so we decided not to in the end. It was, I don't know, like a horror movie set up almost. The whole shady cop tells us to go to the spot where his hillbilly friends are going to kidnap us kind of vibe. So we move on though, pretty early in the day, so we set up our stuff, get a fire going. We float around in our giant four-person inflatable chair boat thing. The biggest highlight of the day was Charles cut down an entire dead tree with nothing but a small axe. Like the midway point between a hatchet and a, a fireman's axe, I guess, but it was an impressive feat of stamina and strength. It was a good day leading into a good night, but right after it got dark, again, I just felt uneasy. The first thing that worried me was a couple of us heard something big splash into the far side of the lake. We thought maybe that it was Moogie, but he was by the fire at this point, his head now perked up and looking in the direction of the splash. Since we were pretty drunk, we thought maybe the floaty thing might just be compromised, so we went down with the flashlights to pull it out of the water and onto the bank. And then, we heard the owl. Charles, Wade and Darren were already passed out by midnight. Rita was humming along by the fireplace with Moogie and me and James were out getting some more wood so the fire would last all night. When we heard an owl start up its hooting. It was a cadence that I was familiar with in this area but something was off about it. I have a bit of a gift for mimicking bird noises so what I noticed immediately is the ending hoot was sort of off. It almost always sounds like the owl is rolling its R's as the final hoot of the sequence goes. James, not really as outdoorsy as me, says, That almost sounds like a person, you know. We end up joking, listen to it a couple more times, then I do my own attempt at an owl noise. Silence. For a few minutes, just as I'm thinking that that makes sense because of the noises, it starts up again. But not just one owl, another started up about half a second after the first, the new owl sounding more like an actual owl than the first one that seemed to have started up again, and after the first hoot from the real owl, the fake one stopped short. James jokes again and says, did that owl just tell the other owl to shut up? I decided to shout, better listen to your wife dude. Immediately after I shout, we both hear a, a loud crashing though, almost identical to the sound of the tree falling that Charles did earlier that day. And at this, Moogie starts to go absolutely berserk, barking and growling. He had a stink land issue at this point still, so he was releasing that nastiness as well, and he was threatened, and luckily Rita was there to keep him from bolting. Big as he was, if he really wanted to move, she wouldn't have been able to do much. But I'm absolutely in fear at this point. I will reiterate too that I have hunted mountain lions and bears in my life and at no point during those hunts was I as shaken and genuinely afraid as this. I was paralyzed for like an entire minute. I shout across the lake, whoever that is you better get lost because we have plenty of guns. Then silence again, luckily too for the rest of the night. I didn't fall asleep until Darren woke up, basically at sunrise, so I missed breakfast and a morning dunk in the lake, uh, the others all did before I got up needing to go to the toilet real bad. Uh, James had already explained the noises to the others by the time that we were all ready for our different adventures. Darren, Wade and Rita just wanted to listen to the radio and chill, Moogie had run off just after lunch and we decided to go look for him while also investigating the area of the noises last night. But almost immediately, when we get to the other side of the lake, the hair stands up on the back of my neck. Charles also feels creeped out, but he had an axe. I had a shotgun, and James also had a rifle and his forty-five holstered on his hip. So, we pressed onward, looking for probably a couple of hours. I was mainly trying to see if we could spot any trees that had fallen, but... Then we made it to the eastern bank of the lake, and we were camped on the western side... What the... Charles says, causing me and James to come rushing over. There, we saw what looked like a human footprint. Just one. But it was very clearly a footprint in the mud. Even had a little pool of water still in it too. Now, to be honest, my first thought was Bigfoot, so... 
I took off my boot and compared sizes. I'm a pretty big guy with pretty large feet as well, so it wasn't a surprise that my clod hoppers dwarfed this footprint when I put my own print down next to it. But what was weird was that the other print, where the pinky toe would be, looked like, I don't know, like another big toe maybe. We also found several downed trees, but none that looked recent, so we decided to go around to the North Lake and back to the others and do a sort of full circle around. Woogie was fine, and as soon as food smells filled the air, he came running back. And we all had a pretty good day again, to be honest. Drinking, feasting, and making fun of each other for being paranoid. But we heard some gunshots a little close that day, and then called out to warn the shooters that there were people and animals nearby. The shooters of us actually went to meet the people, and all of us but Darren and Wade joined the old guy and his wife shooting at whatever we could. Part of me was thinking that anything that was lurking around here sure as heck would not mess with us now. But boy, was I completely wrong about that. So, a brief mention about Charles. Ever since we were kids, Charles has had vivid night terrors. Most of the time, it's just funny, but some of the time it's actually a bit scary. He'd full-on sleepwalk as well and have conversations with you even while still asleep, but... Anyway, we had all gone to bed and I was one of the first due to getting like four hours sleep and being quite rum drunk at this point. Hey, who's that? Captain, stay in your tent. Charles, who was sleeping on a tarp by the fire instead of in a tent, said, or I should say shouted at this point. I shot up, grabbed the shotgun and turned on my flashlight. What's wrong? I shout. Adrenaline filled my entire existence. I could feel my heartbeat pounding in my ears. Come closer to the fire. No, don't crouch down. Use your words. He keeps shouting. Finally, stirring awake James and Rita, who were in the tent closest to Charles. What the? James calls out. Moogie starts growling and apparently let off the stink land again in their tent because him and Rita are like, oh, Moog, gross. And But then I hear... There's somebody sneaking up on Captain's tent. Get out here. I start to unzip my tent. Not you, Captain. Stay in there. He's right next to you. Now, everybody else to this day denies hearing this, but I swear that I heard something whisper Captain before hearing a twig crunch right outside of my tent. James makes it out of his tent, and seconds later, I hear him laughing. It's just the water stump. Charles is having a night terror. But then, Charles claimed that he wasn't dreaming. But when I got out and I shined the light on the stump, he agreed that that had to be it. We put one of those big sort of jugs of water on the top of a stump and it could easily be mistaken for a white shirt standing in the dark. Satisfied too that there wasn't actually anything there, despite my protests, we all went back to bed. Charles stayed in the tent for the rest of the night and... I decided to spend the rest of the night on watch. That, though, was one of, if not the most terrifying nights of my life. Because I heard more activity in those woods than I had heard before. Moogie, too, would wake up and borf multiple times as I'd hear twigs snapping off in the trees. Then I heard a really big snap that had to have only been about 10 feet away. At that, I jumped to my feet, whipped over to where the noise was, and shined my light. Now, I've seen enough deer butt in my life to know what I saw running from me. What was not normal of the deer, however, is that they don't stand up and run off on their two legs like that. Moogie howled and snarled. I took aim, letting my light drop, and I just fired. I didn't care that it turned to run. I just unloaded. There were booms straight until I ran out of all six shells that I had loaded. Everyone else was freaking out and rushed out of their tents. I told them what happened and after that, nobody went back to bed until the morning. Thankfully, nothing else happened that night. And I think Moogie refusing to leave the tent was what allowed the others to take me seriously enough. He was a brave dog after all, sweet and... If other dogs messed with him at the park, he knew how to throw down, but this night, he was different. 
The last thing that happened too on that last day was that Darren and Wade went to go bury the bucket after putting some fresh new supplies in it. They had always known where the cache was buried because there was a, a different stump that they used as a landmark. And that entire stump was just gone. It was there when we retrieved the case two days prior, but now it had vanished. No signs of it being uprooted, mind you, dragged or even disturbed. It simply was as if it just never existed. We genuinely all thought that we had just made a mistake too, until we found the hole for the bucket that we'd made before, still dug and with the little poncho stuffed in it. And that just made absolutely no sense to us. Well, I'm never coming back here now, so we may as well take this stuff with us, Darren said, and after that we all agreed and we all just left after lunch. So, that is why I will never go hiking in the Cascade Wilderness, at least without a firearm, and at least two other people who know how to use them. I don't know what all that was about that night when we were camping at that place, but whatever it was... I'll never forget it. Some folks don't stop searching until they find the truth. And if you've got the eye of a detective, June's Journey is the game for you. Play as the intrepid June Parker and follow her story to solve the death of her sister. You'll hunt for clues in hundreds of beautifully illustrated scenes to uncover new clues in this thrilling murder mystery set in the Roaring Twenties. I really enjoyed playing this game too in my spare time. It sort of reminds me of one of those old school finder books where you have to look for a bunch of different things or people. But the really interesting thing about this particular game is that you're doing this in the midst of a murder mystery, so you have to find clues that assist with solving a crime. I also really like some of the unique features like the ability to build your own island estate with expansive gardens and beautiful buildings but I especially love the contest for short stories, which allows you to even win some prizes. I know some of you listeners are pretty gifted writers, so for you guys, it's worth checking out for sure. All in all too, it's a really fun game that has kept me coming back for more during my downtime on my phone when I'm between tasks and chores and have a spare minute or two. I only started recently too, so I'm on chapter three now, and at the moment, I'm continuing with Claire and Harry Van Buren's Homicide. It's free to download and is a great way to unwind if you enjoy puzzles like I do. So, find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. So this happened 10 years ago now, but I still remember it vividly. This was when I was 18 years old and lived with my parents and siblings in a small town that was right near the Rocky Mountains in Canada. It was summertime and maybe about 11.30 at night. It was a clear night with good visibility too. We no longer live in that town, but we aren't too far from it now too. My friend, who was 17 at the time, also lived with us and she was with me and saw what I saw as well. So, at the time, my family and I were part of what we have now come to know as a cult. This is relevant to the story because it was why we were out late and my parents' door was locked as well. Me and my friend were told that we had to live with the leaders of the cult at this time. It's irrelevant to go into why for this story, but the cult leader's house was across the back alleyway and a few houses down from the parents' house. We didn't want to live with them, so we would spend as much time as possible at my parents' house and leave very late at night to go to the cult leader's house. Like I said too, it was around 11.30 at night, summertime, clear night, when we leave my parents' back door to head to the cult leader's house. And my mum locks the door behind us, turns off the lights and I assume goes to bed. My friend and I walk out through our backyard and are in the alleyway. Our backyard has no fence to it, it just goes straight into the alleyway. But we turn left as the cult leader's house is a few houses down and across the alleyway with a sort of slow incline and a bend. I'm hoping that makes visual sense, but behind us, the alleyway stretches a good five or so houses back, straight. And right as we step into the alleyway, we hear garbage cans from behind us, about a few houses distance behind us, being knocked around. I can only describe this like, imagine someone clumsily knocking into them and trying to stop them from falling down. 
but they keep knocking them in any case. Because we live right near the mountains, we're used to a ton of wildlife in the town. Bears, cougars, sometimes even moose. So my initial instinct is that it's a bear and we've startled it while it was getting into someone's garbage. I immediately panic and am wondering if we go back through the yard and bang on my parents' back door that's locked or if we make a quick break for the cold house because it's most certainly unlocked. I'm making these calculations very split second because it's all happening so quickly. My friend starts saying my name over and over and grabbing my arm. She's looking back towards the garbage cans while I'm trying to plan what to do. Then, all of a sudden, she screams and I look over my shoulder without really any time to think or process at all. And then, I see it. It was huge and flying. It swooped over our heads, maybe four feet above us, and continued up higher, maybe getting to about 15 feet. Again, no time to think, we were both just screaming and yelling at this point. But here's the kicker. It flew right towards the cult leader's house. It banked between cult leader's house and the house beside it, and flew out of sight. When it banked, we had a really clear view of it too, as the streetlights across the alleyway sort of illuminated it well. And I'll describe what it looked like and how... To this day, I just cannot fathom that it could be anything other than paranormal. So its wingspan was about 8 to 9 feet long, maybe larger even. It was inky black, I mean just totally the darkest black that I can describe. I've never seen anything like it before or since color wise. It had no distinguishable features, no feathers, no head, no eyes, no beak, no legs, nothing. The best way that I can describe it, in fact, is that if you imagine sort of like a huge stingray, minus the tail and much, much larger, longer wings. My friend describes it like, imagine a shadow of a large flying creature, but a much more solid, darker shadow. It wasn't transparent. Like, if you touched it, you would feel it for sure, or at least you would think you would. Mind you, it made no sound, other than the smashing of the garbage cans, so it definitely was a, a physical being, and flew so beautifully, so smoothly, I guess you could say. The way it banked between the houses was so effortless, and with it being so large, it was impressive. Anyway, we were totally stunned, shocked, and really, really frightened, we stood there for a short time watching to see if it would come back, but it never did. Eventually, we gathered ourselves and decided to go to the cult house, even though that was the way the creature went, because the door would be unlocked. And when we got inside, we immediately went to one of the leaders. It was the woman. There were two, a man and a woman, and told her everything as best as we could, totally freaked out and shaken up. And when we were finished... She paused and looked at us for a while with a strange look on her face and simply said, and I remember this verbatim, where there is great light, there will be great darkness. And then she just walked off. My friend and I stayed up for hours by the front door looking out, wondering if we would see it again, but we never did and we never actually saw it again afterwards either. I have since that experience attempted to Google on quite a few occasions and really haven't found anything even remotely similar to what we saw that night. So, I guess my question for all of you guys is, has anyone potentially seen anything like this? Or does anyone have any insight? If you do, then I would love to hear from you. Also, thank you a lot for hearing me out. This happened to me as a teen. I must have been about 16 years old at the time, so maybe about 12 years ago. My sister and I were having two friends stay over for a sleepover one night. It was in the middle of the summer and we lived in a tiny town, actually a hamlet. It was surrounded by prairies, lots of farmland. My sister and the one friend, they fell asleep fairly early on in the night, but my other friend and I stayed awake chatting for a while. We had our mattress on the floor, right by the three big windows in my sister's room, where on the second floor. 
These windows looked out to the street below and then across the street to our left was an elementary school. The parking lot for that school was in the middle of our view and then next to the parking lot, more towards our right, was a farmer's field. So we stay up chatting until 2.33 in the morning. Windows are wide open as there's a lovely warm breeze coming in. And suddenly, my friend stops the conversation and says something like, Oh, who's that? I follow her gaze and see that she's looking toward the farmer's field. I see two figures coming out of the field. It's obviously dark and they haven't yet come into the streetlights, so I can't make out any features yet, but I assume it's just some of the kids in the neighborhood. My friend and I continue to watch in silence as these two people make their way into the streetlights and start coming directly toward the house. Now, I really assume that it's someone that I know because there's a few teen boys that would often be out late. Men would come to the house and talk to me and my sister from the window sometimes. As they're getting closer, we begin to make out their appearance and I was absolutely shocked at how they looked. These two individuals couldn't have been taller than five feet. They were identical in all features that we could make out anyway and I mean absolutely identical. They were both Caucasian, white colored, they both had totally bald heads and they were both wearing the same long brown robe with a tie at the waist. How I would describe it is that they sort of looked like they were in monk attire I guess. They honestly just looked like little people. Even though they clearly don't look like anyone that I know, as they're coming towards the house, I begin to call out to them in a sort of loud whisper like, Hey, hey you, and then I start yelling out names of the different people in town that I know. I think I was in a bit of disbelief and thought that maybe it was a prank or something. All the while, my friend is totally stunned into silence. These beings make it just up to my parents' cars parked outside, so we have a very clear view of them at this point, and then they immediately turn on themselves and go back in the direction towards the field. They never once acknowledged my calls too. They didn't even seem to look up. But they also appeared to be in discussion with each other. Though my friend and I didn't make out any sounds coming from them. We continue to watch them make their way back across the road and then instead of going back into the field, they start walking down the road. We watch them until... Well, we can just no longer see them. If you follow that specific road, it just leads to more fields, mind you, and away from any houses. My friend and I stayed up for another hour talking about what the heck we saw. She's a, a pretty devout Christian, so believes that it was demonic. Me, personally, I have no idea. It very well could have been demonic, I suppose, but it's also just so, I don't know, random. The next day we told everyone and they all seemed kind of freaked out by it, even my parents. And I just have so many questions. Like, why did they come towards the house, only then to turn back on themselves? I've wondered if they intentionally did it. Like, they knew that we were there and wanted us to see them or something. Why were their appearances absolutely identical? Why bald, short? Why the brown robes? Also... What's up with them being out at like 3am in a field? I have googled and I haven't been able to find much. I did find an obscure YouTube video of a lady saying that she was visited by seven beings that sound exactly like what my friend and I saw but I haven't found anything else. This lady said that they're interdimensional beings that know the future apparently. I don't know about that but Anyways, I would love to hear if anybody else has seen these beings or what your thoughts are. And thanks for listening. So, some other people have asked me to share more of my experiences regarding the time that I spent in the cult. Paranormal encounters that started happening in the home and when we moved to the same town as the leaders, even more started to happen too. To recap, I've shared some experiences already. The first was when my friend and I saw two small beings coming out of a field at 3am in long brown robes with bald heads, identical to each other. 
The second experience was when another friend and fellow cult member and I saw a large blacker than black being fly over our heads. It was formless and about eight to nine feet across. And when I say formless, I mean it had no distinguishable features, no head or eyes or arms or legs or anything. This happened in the alleyway between our house and the cult leader's house too. So, another experience that I had was a little different to those. During our time in the cult, the leaders decided that I should move in with them. I think I mentioned this in a previous story too. They had five teenage girls living there at the time. I was one of them. One evening, I was doing my homework on the kitchen table with the same friend who saw that flying black creature with me. When suddenly, out of nowhere, my back started stinging. And I mean really burning sort of stinging. I was irritated by it and was trying to reach around to feel what was going on. Finally, after a minute or so, I asked my friend to have a look as it was really starting to bug me. I roll up my shirt and she stares at my back in confusion. I ask her what she sees and she tells me that I have three long scratches down my back. They look like cat scratches, but much too big to be a cat scratch. The scratches were spaced apart too wide to be a cat and they also didn't have a cat anyway. She seemed quite freaked out by it so I go to the bathroom to view it myself. But they're pretty much centered down my back and also behind my bra strap and there was just no way that I could reach that. To be honest I wasn't too worried at the time though. I mean I just figured that it had somehow happened earlier and I was only feeling it then for some reason. But then this happened again, a couple of months later approximately. I was playing a computer game at the desk in the room that me and two other girls shared and when I felt that sting or burning sensation again, exactly like before as well. Again, I try to reach around and feel what was going on. I go to the bathroom and lift my shirt. I see three scratch marks again, very similar to the ones before, but not quite as long and a little off to the side this time. I was a little worried this time, but told myself that it must be due to the clothing that I'm wearing or something. I put it out of mind and never thought about it until years later when I heard about this phenomena happening to many others too. The next one happened before I moved out. My sister and I were in her room in the basement. It was late morning. Next to her room is the utility room and then the stairs going up. Her bedroom door was closed and we were just chatting and hanging out in her room. We were about to go upstairs when out of nowhere we hear this growl or roar coming from the utility room area. It wasn't like any growl that I can explain because it wasn't like a dog growl or a big cat growl or anything. If I had to describe it though it had that sort of deep low sound of a large cat like a, a lion or a tiger perhaps. And it had a similar volume to a large cat as well, but maybe closer to a bear, maybe? It's hard to explain, but when I first heard it, I was so confused and immediately frightened, obviously. My mind was racing, wondering how on earth I was hearing what sounded like a wild animal in the house. We didn't have a dog either, by the way, but then my mind went to, it must be someone walking a large, aggressive dog outside, even though it didn't sound like a dog and the sound is carrying through the walls weirdly or something. I was trying to make sense of it is what I'm saying, but something primal inside kicked off I think, and because I became filled with dread, the growling got louder and it sounded like it was making its way towards her door. I looked to my sister with panic and see that she is frozen on the spot. Her face was filled with fear and also confusion. I remember actually wanting to escape out of her bedroom window at that point. My sister told me to stop and be quiet, but I couldn't. The growling was getting louder and closer and seemed to be right outside the door now. I couldn't just do nothing as well, so I started screaming for my mum, just calling out to her over and over. The growling immediately stopped when I did that too. I keep my screaming up for a minute or so and then I stop and we listen. There's no growling anymore and it's totally silent. My heart is pounding and I tell my sister that we have to run out. She tries to stop me but I open the door anyway. I quickly look around and we don't see anything so I race upstairs with my sister right behind me. 
but we run to my mum and we tell her. Another incident that happened involved a time again when I was in my sister's room. I had decided to sleep in her room that night. We had just gotten into bed and were talking. And almost as soon as our conversation ended, when the room was totally silent, a voice came from the end of the bed and broke that silence. It was a loud whisper and it said my name as clear as day, just my name, nothing else. I couldn't tell if the voice was male or female, but it was just a, a very loud whisper. I immediately grabbed my sister and said her name. I was completely freaked out, obviously, and she responded right away and said, I heard it too. At that, I was terrified. I clung to her trying to process what we heard and what could be the possible cause, and she said that we mustn't give it attention. I couldn't stay there though, so I got up to get a glass of water and to calm down. I slept on the couch that night too, and I was just completely terrified the entire night. Anyway, I'll have to share more stories another time because this is already getting a bit long, but yeah, those are just some of the experiences that I had there at that cult. I still don't know how to explain many of them, but they are things that just stay with you, I guess. About 10 or so years ago, when I was a teen and still living with my parents, a very strange and creepy thing happened. In this particular house, we had all sorts of strange things going on. Too much to include now, but this particular incident was really unsettling. It was very late at night, maybe early morning hours even, very dark outside. The whole house was asleep, I have four siblings. My brother's room was across the hall from my parents' room and my sisters and I slept in the basement. My parents awoke suddenly to the sound of my youngest brother's voice, five years old at that time, screaming out at my dad, just yelling dad, dad, dad over and over again in a, a loud and terrified voice. My dad jumps out of bed and rushes to my brother's room. It takes him all of like three seconds to get to my brother's room. When he opened the door, the yelling suddenly stopped. He saw both my little brothers fast asleep. He gently whispered to the brother whose voice that he had heard and tapped him to see if he was having a bad dream or something, but got no response. My dad thought that that was kind of weird, but just chalked it up to some kind of a nightmare or dream response. He walked back to his room, but no sooner did he get back into bed, literally the moment that he sat down on the mattress, they then heard my voice, this time screaming out to my mum, 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 over and over again. They said that I sounded completely terrified, just like how my brother sounded, and like I needed help, and that it was exactly my voice, just like it was exactly my brother's voice. But this time, the sound was coming from outside of their open bedroom window, where the backyard and the back alley is. My mum and dad looked at each other, perplexed, my mum jumped out of bed this time and decided to come and check on me in the basement, even though the voice was coming from outside. She makes her way down, and I remember this part. She woke me up in the room and asked me if I was calling out to her. I was groggy and tired and thought that she was being weird, and of course I said no, and I fell right back to sleep. As she's making her way back up the stairs, she hears my voice again, the same terrified voice screaming out to her, but from the front of the house this time. She stood by the big front window in the living room and looked out onto the street, but there was no one out there, not even a, a car driving by. It was totally still, and the screaming suddenly stopped. At that point, she knew that there was something sinister going on. She went back to bed and her and my dad talked for a bit and prayed and then they went to sleep. They didn't hear the voices again that night, but the next day she told us what happened and obviously we were pretty terrified. She said that it was uncanny, the likeness to mine and my brother's voice. I even did an impression of what the voice could have sounded like and my mum said yes. It was the exact same tone, sound, everything. So, I'm wondering if you guys have any theories as to why this happens. 
why these mimic beings take an interest in people. And my gut says that it's just to mess with us and scare us, but I am curious as to what others think. So around 11 years ago, I was a telecoms engineer. The normal day went to a few residential houses, either fitted or fixed phone lines. Everything was no different from any other day. But then I downloaded my next job and I got a 20 line installation. Now, this is not the norm for the role that I had as uh, these tasks usually went to other teams really. And no issues though, I thought that it would be nice to be somewhere for longer than an hour or two I guess. Better than being here and there and everywhere, I suppose, and I called the contact. It's a contact center who tells me that either the caretaker or manager of the building is aware and will explain what was required when I get there. So I arrive, and it's a really old building built in the 1920s, I later found out. I make my way in, tester and tool bag, as is the norm, and after speaking with the receptionist, I discover that the building was at one point a nursing home, and after being derelict for a few years, it's now being used as offices for various businesses. As promised, two managers arrived to tell me that they think what I am looking for is in the cellar as there's a lot of cables down there, and that's all that they really know. So I asked if the caretaker is about, as they usually know these types of things. I was told that he wasn't, as he was ill, but due back in the next day or two. I follow this man and woman to a number padlocked door and they open it, tell me the code and on the other side of the door is a stairwell that just leads down to the cellar. So as we get down there, the light is pretty poor. In fact, it's really poor I guess, but I have no chance of working like this and I mean, there were lights yes, but you're talking to pendant lights that weren't really great and understanding this. The woman tells me that they have hanging lights, so no issues. I go back to the van, grab an extension, and head back towards the cellar. So as I'm passing the receptionist, she asked us, Are you going to be in the cellar on your own? So I just replied, Yeah, sometimes you have to, but if what I'm looking for isn't there, I won't be for long, I guess. She laughed, but told me, Better you than me. Nobody likes going down there, even for storage space. Now, I'll be honest, I just thought people don't like stairs to a dark place. No worries, but not something I'm unfamiliar with, so it just needs to be done. And after a quick look around with the make manager, we find a socket, I sort the lights, and yep, yeah, there is the DP that I'm looking for, but it's an older sort of solder block, no good for broadband, so I let him know that this is going to take a bit longer, and this is even before knowing where these 20 lines need to go. He just agrees and shows me where the office fitters have left all the cables for the clients, which to my relief was in the cupboard behind the receptionist. So all set, knowing what I know, I now crack on. I'm testing all the lines and it's going pretty well. I've more than half gone through all the cabinets and a few shy, but I know the area and know from there I can get them through as it's got two 200 pair cables that run through it. At this point, it's around 4 o'clock and I don't have the blocks that I need on the van, so tag up the cables and turn off all the lights on my way out before closing and lock the door on the way out too. I sign out and tell the girl at the desk I'll see her tomorrow and I leave. On my way home, I call my manager to tell them the script and that I may actually need a hand for half a day or more as I'm not even sure anything has been done in the exchange yet. But the next day, 8 a.m., I get a call from one of the other lads who tells me that he's with me all day and that's all that he knows. We sort out a roll each and I'll push the pairs from the box to the cab and you do the cab and exchange if needed and then it's just a case of fitting the box and running a large internal cable from the box to behind the receptionist. I make my way into the building once again, open the door with the code and to my surprise, all the lights are on. Now. I am 100% sure that I turned them off, so I'm guessing one of the managers may have come to check if I was still there and left them on by mistake. I go down and do what I need to do and leave to push through the cables outside, call my mate and he's getting them by one and so it's all going well. I finish up and I head back to fit the block. 
As I grab the blocks, drill and all the bits and etc etc, set up Mark for the pilot holes and just hear, what are you doing? After nearly jumping out of my skin, I turn and see this man with grey overalls on. So, I say, uh, I'm just doing what's been asked of me. Are you the caretaker? He replies that he is and he says that nobody has been down here for years and he was surprised that I was there. So I just cracked on, done the drilling, etc. And then as soon as I'd stopped with the drill and it was quieter, this guy just sort of started chatting away. Like, what football team do you support? Do you mind if I watch what you're doing? I told him no worries and just tried to be polite as I could. He then told me that his name was Gordon and that he'd been working there for over 30 years. A bit confused, recalling that the receptionist had said that uh, I told him that I was under the impression that this place had been empty for a few years and looking at the cabling it's been updated for at least 15 to 20 years. He just said that things are always happening here. After about an hour of back and forth while I'm working, I hear a hello from the top of the stairwell. Expecting Gordon to answer, I didn't. Then it came again, so I turned around and Gordon has gone now. I'm thinking that I've been waffling for 10 minutes and he's not even here. I pop up and it's one of the managers asking if I'm expecting somebody, another engineer. So I apologize and explain the phone signal isn't very good down there, so he probably hasn't been able to get a hold of me. All cleared, he comes down, we chat for five, and he tells me that we'll start at the receptionist end and work to me while I finish. After a quick toilet break, I go back down and I'm in the final stages now. I'm just putting phone numbers to pairs as for when my mate gets there, we can connect the test and go. As I'm doing this, I hear, sorry about that. Again, out of nowhere, it's Gordon. So I just acknowledge it, call him clever, and make a joke that if they can't find you, they can't ask you to do anything. I continue for five minutes, and I've done all that I can, so I tell him that I'm just heading up to assist my mate, and we'll be done soon and out of the way. Gordon then told me that he liked the company, and it's been nice to talk. I felt saddened at this point, thinking that he was maybe treated poorly by people that I'm in the building with. So I just said, of course mate, costs nothing to be nice and have a chat. So I go up the stairs, leaving Gordon down there and help get the cable through a void and into the cellar. 10, 20 minutes of trying to fish it through, we got it and we go down. And Gordon is not around and we finish. My mate tells me it's time for food and he'll go to the chippy and meet me back at the yard as... I tell him that I just need a few signatures and to make sure the lights go back on so that I can get my extension lead. I get what I need from the manager's signatures and show him where the link is behind the reception. I inform him that I need to get my extension lead, so are the lights okay there for now and all that? Or does he want me to move them as we go and there's a good light? And He states that they might as well stay for now and he'll get another lead in case anybody else needs to go down there. I head down and start unplugging the lights and Gordon appears again telling me that he didn't realize the lights were mine as he wouldn't have touched them. Straight away I thought, ah, so that's why they were on this morning. But then it dawned on me that the door, it was locked. I asked him if he came down yesterday evening and he said, yes, of course, I'm always here. It's where I'm needed. Confused and just wanting to disappear at this point, I said, oh, no worries, nice to meet you, and I place my hand and put it to shake out. He just raises his hand and says, hope to see you soon. So that was a bit weird, but I left, signed out, and thought nothing of it. So weeks go by, and I get a call from our control, asking if I can return to this address as one of the lines isn't working and it's high level. So I say, yeah, no worries. I get there, say hello again to the receptionist. I asked if I could just check behind her first before having to go into the cellar. With some joy, it ends up being there. It just needs to be put on properly. And as I'm sorting it out, an older guy, he asks me if I was the one who was there last week. I say yes. He apologized and stated that he was the caretaker and had to take more days off than planned. I just told him, oh, don't worry about it, man. I'm sure Gordon will tell you where everything is. And as soon as I said this, 
he just looked me dead in the eyes and said, What did you just say? So I said, Gordon, he told me that he's the caretaker here. This guy went absolutely white and just asked me if we could talk outside. So, of course, I followed him and he simply asked me if I believed in ghosts. Then he told me that before this was what it was today, it was a nursing home and the old caretaker, his name was actually Gordon. He knew this as when the building was taken over, he found an old desk to do lists and letters and requests for a Gordon and there was a sign on the door which said caretaker and where this desk was, that door led to the cellar. I immediately rubbished this obviously and started laughing thinking him and his mate were just pulling my leg. He then asked me though if he was wearing overalls, which I replied he was. He just sort of looked at me dead in the eye and said, Listen mate, I'm not lying. Gordon passed away years ago, supposedly on the job. I just thought you should know and it's not something that's considered funny, telling me that he has been mocked as he has also seen Gordon, but people just have never believed him. And I never really said a thing to anybody beyond that. Until one night fishing with a friend and just like he said, he thought that I was just messing around. But I know what I saw and I know what I heard. I don't normally tell this to anybody as it's just not really worth the ridicule but after this experience all I can say is that I guess ghosts or spirits, they're real. On June 3rd, 2016, I had a social event. I was an Instagram influencer and the event was a golf tournament. I posted on social to ask followers to come, so when he showed up, it didn't surprise me. Sure, the tickets were $250, but for some reason, that didn't click with me. It was a drinking event as well, and he showed up at least tipsy, but having a good time. He was also an Instagram model who I knew online. He asked me on a date for after the tournament. I was a single mum and because of the event, my parents were watching the kid until the next day, so I said sure. We went off on the date, went to a bar and grabbed some food. The man was handsome but mostly charming as heck. We had a beer and then in his car he offered some weed. I rarely smoked but decided what the heck that day. We hotboxed. Then went off to a bar and he was friendly with everyone and made me laugh quite a few times. Then off to the liquor store for more alcohol and finally to his house. I was drunk and high so it was easy to sleep with me. He had a bunk bed and I remember him being on top and being very selfish and aggressive and being scared. I didn't stop him out of fear though and me had driven and my car was still at the golf tournament location and we were far too far for me to afford an Uber back to my car. The next morning I went to the restroom and afterward I noticed a, a long pipe coming from the toilet after I flushed. He came out upset because it was to water the weed him and his roommate were apparently growing and I didn't know or as too drunk or high still to click. I apologized deeply and was just honestly a bit scared. We came downstairs though and I looked at the walls and the decor for the first time and there were knives and weapons used as decorations all over the house. I waited for him to have breakfast and drive me back to my car, trying not to show my panic. In the car I knew that I needed an excuse that wouldn't hurt his feelings, so I told him that I had a blast and I'm really bummed because I really like him but my child's father passed away when he was one, which was true and I can't have CPS take him away because I'm around someone growing weed and all that. I told him that I didn't care about the weed and didn't want him to change so it was a bummer but I let him make out with me one last time as he dropped me off. I was shaking as I drove off because of the vibes but the very next day after he dropped me off he met a girl that was 10 years our junior and an 18 year old mini me pretty much. He dated her for three weeks, she dumped him and apparently he stalked her like crazy. So much so that he was arrested a few times. In September of the same year, he gets out of jail the last time and he heads to a bar, meets a girl there and takes her home and 
he ends up murdering her and it is an absolutely gruesome story what happened to her. He's currently serving life for his crime and I get flashbacks all the time about how that could have easily been me. Summer of 2008 was a really rough time to graduate from college. I had just spent four years getting a degree, only to find out that the job market had all but dried up. As bummed out as I was about being unemployed for the foreseeable future, I found a deep appreciation for backcountry camping and hiking that summer. Growing up in the Rocky Mountains and graduating from a college in western Montana, I was not a stranger to hiking or camping. But that summer, it became an escape to the point of almost an obsession. Going on daily hikes and camping beneath the stars really helped my mental health while I worried about my life's purpose and my future. It was June though and seasonably cold, wet and cloudy. The daytime highs barely touched 50 degrees and at night it dropped below freezing. Despite the weather, I had planned to hike around the Anaconda Range that week and I was going to let that deter me. My plan for the week, funny enough, was to hike from Storm Lake, over Storm Lake Pass, and down to Upper Seymour Lake. Storm Lake, actually an alpine reservoir, is a challenge to get to and requires a 4x4 pickup and some skilled driving too. The road is a, a narrow two-track winding its way through the thick pine forests. The way was slick with rain, but I made it to the top with little heartburn. I set up camp on the north shore of the lake and I decided to do some fishing. The fishing, it was miserable. It was cold and nothing was biting. But the best thing about bad fishing is that my thoughts were free to wander while I sat on the shore. The rain was a, a constant light drizzle and created a natural white noise, which was nice. Time passed and my daydreams were cut short as a, a low rumble from up the canyon overtook the sounds of the rain. The rumbling was not unlike a distant diesel engine, I guess, but there are no roads that go beyond where I was camped. No machinery or vehicles could be up that canyon too. Maybe it's a plane, I thought, looking up in the rain clouds. But the sound wasn't getting closer or further away, and the sound was above me. It came from beyond the lake and up into the canyon. But the sound was sort of stationary, I guess, and constant. This was most certainly not a plane or a truck or a bulldozer. And while all of this wasn't outright scary, nevertheless my hair stood on end while I sat there listening. After 20 minutes, the rumbling faded away and I was left again with only the sound of the raindrops. Soon enough, I caught a decent sized trout, cleaned it and I headed back to camp to get ready for dinner. The fish cooked up fine, but to be honest, I hate trout, so... I mean, it's edible, sure, but totally unappetizing, for me anyway. They just taste like mud, I guess, and I ate as much as I could stand and tossed the rest into the lake. Building up my fire for the night, I sat back to enjoy the evening with a bit of whiskey. Night came fast, too. The mountain ridges put the sun to bed early here, and the rain clouds obscured the starlight as well. It was dark... In fact, really dark that night. The sounds of a, a crackling warm fire and the rain bouncing off my tent were a, a great comfort and starting to lull me to sleep. I reminded myself that I needed to build up the fire before bed, so I walked over to my pile of scavenged firewood and grabbed an armful. But being away from the fires crackling for a moment, I could pick up that all-too-familiar rumbling rising in the background again. It was growing louder than before and closer as well. I thought to myself that uh, I may have had a, a few too many pulls of whiskey and was tired and grouchy. This noise was ruining my camping trip and my buzz as well. So frustrated, I yelled into the blackness of the night, Hey, shut up! And like a switch being flipped, the rumbling stopped. And so did the rain. I will admit that at that, my heart skipped a beat. I realized that that was not a convenient coincidence. There was an intelligence out there, 
something sentient, observing me and responding to my screams, and I wasn't getting the most positive vibes from it too. I threw all the logs on the fire and I retreated back to my tent. More on edge than ever, I just sort of sat there, listening, listening to the fire crackling, to my rapid breathing, and beyond that to the silence of the darkness. Before this moment, I had felt alone but safe. Now, I felt alone and vulnerable. Beyond where the firelight faded, I felt as if there were a million eyes in that dark, watching me. My paranoia began to subside when the rain suddenly started again. Not a drizzle, but a massive downpour too. I was glad that I had built up the fire or it would have been snuffed out for sure. Unfortunately though, my tent was being pushed down by the force of the storm. I thought about bailing to the truck, but I knew that I would be soaked to the bone instantly. Risking injury or death over getting wet is the kind of logic only whiskey can produce, right? I could feel the rainwater pooling and moving under my tent. This storm wasn't letting up. The urge to get into the pickup and drive away was even more tantalizing. I could get my stuff tomorrow in the daylight and spend a few nights in town, but I'd had a bit too much to drink. Driving, especially on that slick, muddy two-track road, would have been a death sentence for sure, I thought. But I still needed a safer place to sleep than a wimpy tent. So, grabbing what I could, I ripped open the tent flaps and I ran for the truck. I was soaking wet by the time that I settled into the driver's seat and locked the doors. Turning the heat on full blast, I hoped that that would dry me out. It was going to be a miserable night though, so I reclined my chair and tried to calm my thoughts with deep breaths. The rain wasn't letting up. I was warm from the heater thankfully and I was riding the crest of a good whiskey buzz. The fire was still raging despite the rain and kept the campsite well lit. Now, I remember the truck's clock reading 1.06am. Then I blinked. It was only a moment, but when I opened my eyes, the rain had suddenly stopped. In fact, it was foggy and quiet. The once raging campfire was now just embers. And the weirdest thing was that there was morning twilight to the east. I instantly looked at the truck's clock and it now read 5.45 a.m. It was morning. That couldn't be right. Almost five hours gone in the blink of an eye? I must have passed out or something. My head was killing me all of a sudden too. To be honest, I didn't feel like I had drank that much to justify that kind of hangover. I turned off the truck and I stepped out to survey the night's damage. My tent was now completely flattened. The tent poles were shattered to pieces. Everything was soaking wet. And smothering the remains of the fire, I dragged all my junk to the pickup and I tossed it into the bed. My hike over the pass wasn't happening today, that was for sure. It was around 6.30am though before I finished picking up camp and... As I climbed into the cab of my truck, I then heard that rumbling again through the morning fog. As soon as I heard it, I drove out of there as fast as I could down that muddy bobsled track of a road, not once looking into the rearview mirror either. I have never been back to Storm Lake and, to be honest, I probably never will. So I was 10 years old and back then, my friends and I would ride our bikes as far as we could, looking for adventure or to discover something new and exciting. But this time, my community was a mix of new and old and it was easy to find an old tunnel, the remains of a farmhouse or decayed paths and trails. So we set out that summer day with one extra boy than the usual crew. I had not formally met with him yet, but nevertheless we headed out on our bikes. We came across an abandoned house near a farmer's field and forest. We started to explore the premises and we decided to settle here for a while. We walked in, checked things out and we're just sort of hanging out and sharing our findings. 
but at some point I started to hear the sound of rocks or gravel or something like that being moved through water, sort of like slurry emanating from the basement. I thought that it was my friends playing in the house and so I briefly ignored it, but suddenly there was wailing and the sound of gravel was getting louder, like thrashing, like someone was throwing rocks of gravel or something. Frozen now, there was no way that my friends could make that noise. Then, all of a sudden, quite fast talking surrounded us. My one friend started to cry uncontrollably. His brother, a pretty brave kid, was preparing to protect his brother. Together, we could see inside the house's front hall and stairwells. The new boy was giggling and gesturing us to come downstairs by waving us in with his hand. But we stood there, dumbfounded. How or what was making that noise? How did he not know the immediate danger that we were in, that he was in? I wanted to get him as I thought that this was possibly his last moment on the planet, but I watched him return up from the dark stairwell leading to the basement. He was still giggling and mirroring the exact same motion. He returned again downstairs and out of sight. We screamed at him not to go, but he kept doing the exact same thing just over and over again. He was actually sort of speeding up too, like two times and three times faster. The noises from the basement I can only really describe as just pure despair, like an agonizing, painful, and doom-like quality, but they were human for sure, or at least human-like. We screamed at this guy, though, that we're leaving, and it seemed like he was coming outside with us. Frantic, we just started biking as fast as possible, petrified with fear, and I didn't look back. It was dusk now and we had no time to reconvene, so we separated immediately and went home before we were grounded. I asked my friends the next day if anyone saw the other boy, and they responded that they thought that he was somebody else's friend from our group. We ended up talking for a little while and we discovered that we didn't even know his name or where he came from and after that, we actually never saw him again. So, I'm going to try and sort these events out chronologically. They happen between my 14 and 20 years of age. For context, I'm currently 22. The village in question is called Mojksa. It's in Poland. I've also not lived there for like two years now, but an important thing that I want to mention is a warm friend of mine that I met here, Jacob. He will be crucial to several situations. So firstly... The forest itself was huge, although typical of forests in Poland, I guess. My friend and I often spent our free time there. The forest had no owner and we loved exploring it. We built a small bridge by the stream so that we didn't have to go around it or jump over it. A few days after building it too, when we were returning home from deeper parts of the forest, as if from a tree, a stone flew towards me, which almost hit me in the head. At the time, for a long time afterwards, we joked about it, although it was a pretty dangerous situation to be honest because the rock was large enough probably to kill me if it hit me. Of course, we ignored it, not thinking too much of it, but it was harvest time and as I remember, there were bales of hay in the fields at the time, which we loved to jump over. We chose fields that were more submerged in the woods so as not to risk being caught by the farmers was already getting dark, more slowly sunset, and on our return we saw a black figure behind a, a small stream, different from the first place. This forest repeatedly crossed by water. We looked at the figure for a while too, but couldn't quite make out what it was at the time. But we laughed and said that it must have been the figure that threw the stone that time. Thirdly, we saw this figure again, twice on another day, shortly after the previous incident, in the same areas. And fourthly, this is the last part where my friend was with me, and in the deeper parts of the forest we found something like rabbit holes, only bigger. We have seen rabbit dens quite often here, so I doubt that we would have been wrong, but nearby we found a traveling suitcase with strange things inside. From that moment on, too, my friend stopped attending this forest. I think something must have spooked him. 
I myself enjoyed running through the forest, in other parts of it, especially in the evening. I came across a phenomenon that I would mostly describe as earth breathing, I guess you could say. In a certain area, the ground regularly rose and fell, and it was really cool to watch. But this is where things started to get weird. I covered my running route as usual, but on this day, I turned back. While running, I heard an unnatural growl from the bushes. Over the years, I've clocked wolves or foxes, but this, this sounded really different to that. There seemed to be nothing in the bushes too when I looked, but preferring not to tempt fate, I turned back and I went home. The growl itself was deep though and very bassy and... Lastly, and probably the strangest thing, I was already of age and it was dark. My one of the few trips after that. It was one of the few trips after dark that I took and I don't even remember what for to be honest, but passing a long path in the woods, I heard not far away, but in the denser part of the forest, uh, a kind of, I know this is going to sound weird, but choir, something like church singing. I'm not an expert, but it sounded like it was in Latin, and so I ignored it, and going back after this time, obviously, I didn't hear anything anymore. But years later, my friend and I came to the conclusion that there was probably black masses or something of that nature going on in that forest. There were also often very suspicious cars hanging around in the area for years, and I'm not a big believer myself, but to be honest... It is a possible explanation. In the end, who knows what actually all of that was, but I don't think that I'm going to go back there, just in case. So about five years ago, when I was 17, I visited some of my family who lived in South Dakota and worked there for the summer. After about a month... My brother, sister, and her husband decided to do what Americans do best and go shoot guns in the woods. I had to work an evening shift, so it was decided that we'd go after around 10pm. Once my shift ended, we went to their house to pack up the truck with some snacks, guns, and ammo. The drive took around 45 minutes, and it took us up a dirt road surrounded by trees and tall grass. Eventually, it opened up into a clearing that was pretty open and flat, the nearest tree line was about 100 feet away. It was pretty dark, but the clearing was lit up by the truck's headlights. For some reason, too, I kind of felt a bit uneasy, but I chalked that up to just being in the woods at night. For the first 20 minutes, nothing really happened, too. We were just setting up plastic bottles and those plastic gallon buckets that you get water out of at an office. But there was a, a feeling of being watched that we all felt, and the area suddenly just reeked of spoiled eggs. Those of you who have shotguns know what that smells like, but even since going to the military, no amount of guns, explosions have ever smelt this bad. We looked around to see if we could see the source of what it was, and what I saw, I can still vividly remember to this day. It was a, a thin humanoid figure crouching down, just looking at us. Even while crouching down, it was still above six feet in height. And when I say that this figure was thin, I mean skin and bones barely do it justice. The even weirder thing about this was, though, is that we all saw the figure in different spots in the tree line, but we all described the same features. Tall, thin, had long, dark hair. Whatever the case, we quickly packed up what we could and we just left and the feeling of dread that we felt that day will forever haunt me. Since then, my brother mentioned the area might have been in native territory, but I don't know if that's true or not. Every once in a while, I think back on that day, and I look up different stories and encounters people have in those woods, but nothing ever quite resembles what I saw that day. In April 2019, I was an exchange student in South America. I went on a trip to the Amazon with a group of other exchange students. And while many strange things happened, I would like to focus on two in particular. So at the time, I was 18 years old, 
tall and thin and white with blue eyes. Mentioned just because I always stood out as a tourist. I was fluent in Spanish, allowing me to talk to locals without misunderstandings. The first incident occurred on our first night or morning in the Colombian or Brazilian town of Leticia. We were all staying in a hotel, and it had a really strange vibe. I didn't feel comfortable, and neither did my friends. The hotel staff were staring at us like creeps, which made it even more scary. But during breakfast, I overheard other exchange students discussing a missing phone. I offered to help locate it using the Find My iPhone app, and we were able to track it down to a, a really sketchy part of town. The police accompanied us to the location, and we found the house where the phone was. The family denied involvement, but their behavior and the fact that the phone signal was coming from their place made it clear to us that they had probably stolen it. They came out with knives and machetes yelling and staring at us. It was really intense, and I felt a shiver down my spine, and I had a very strong gut feeling that we needed to leave. We told the police to back off and not to do anything about the phone because we were worried about our safety, and the phone just wasn't worth it. When we came back to the hotel, the police wanted to see if there were any cameras pointed at the door of the room from the outside of... When we came back to the hotel, the police wanted to see if there were any cameras pointed at the door of the room from the outside or the inside. The scary part is that they had cameras from the inside and outside. Only these two cameras were mysteriously turned off for two hours that night. I also know about another incident and found out that the cameras were turned off by someone from the hotel staff. I really don't feel too comfortable sharing that, as it involved one of my friends. It was very serious and some legal actions were taken too. But one of our other stops was in a small village in Peru's part of the Amazon. I don't remember the town's name, but it had around 150 people and the village was built on pillars above the water as the river Amazon was overflowing or something. After we arrived and settled in at the local hotel, we were taken to a stage where we were introduced to the region's indigenous dances, songs, and culture. After the performance, the group returned to the hotel, but I decided to stay back and talk to some of the locals. I wanted to see an anaconda, a very dumb and touristy I know, but someone had told me that this was a good time to see them hunt. I started talking to a local guy, and he claimed that he couldn't show me where to see a live anaconda, but offered to show me a picture of one that he had taken a few days ago on his phone. Now, despite what my parents always taught me about going to strangers' houses, I foolishly decided to follow him to this remote, isolated home deeper in the jungle. As we walked, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease and danger though lurking around every corner. When we arrived, he instructed me to wait in the living room while he searched for his phone, but as I stood alone in the dimly lit room... My gut told me that something was wrong. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was in grave danger all of a sudden. After what felt like an eternity, he returned and said that he couldn't find his phone. He asked me to come back the next day, but I knew that I had to get out of there as soon as I could. I thanked him and left, but my heart was pounding with fear and adrenaline. When I returned to the hotel and told my friends what had happened... They were horrified. They couldn't believe that I put myself in such a dangerous situation. I couldn't shake off the feeling that something terrible could have happened if I had stayed any longer. Looking back, I realized that the encounter was bizarre, even if he was truly just a kind person, but I just cannot shake off that feeling that something was about to happen to me. It scares me to think about how gullible I was back then, even though I consider myself rational and sometimes even paranoid, I didn't listen to my instincts that day. And I genuinely think that I put myself in a lot of danger. So for some context, I live in a major city and currently I don't do a lot of driving due to ongoing issues with my car. Plus, the pandemic has made me turn to more delivery apps in general. But the other day, around 1pm, I decided to order some lunch after doing a lot of cleaning. I placed the Uber Eats order and found something to watch while I waited for the food. 
Within a few minutes, a driver accepted the order and I noticed right away that the driver, Anthony, was on a bike and didn't have a profile picture or any deliveries on record. At first, I wasn't really alarmed, to be honest. I mean, I was sort of amused, like, oh wow, I guess I'm this person's first ever customer. But then, uh, a full 30 minutes passes with no driver movement on the app. And at this point, I think that maybe something is glitching out or the driver is stuck or something, so... I contact support via the chat option and they ended up assigning a new driver because they couldn't reach the first one. Odd, but whatever, right? But now is when things started getting a little weirder. The new driver assigned is in the exact same spot as the original driver was and they're also on a bike, also have no profile picture and have no prior deliveries as well, and this driver's name was Lori. I let another 20 minutes pass with no driver movements before I message them myself and say, Hi there, are there any issues with the order? The app shows that the driver saw the message, but no response. All this time I'm checking to see if Uber Eats is maybe experiencing issues. None that I could find though. And at this point, while I'm definitely weirded out, I'm mostly just hungry, so I contact support again to request some assistance. They reassign the driver again and apologize for the inconvenience. Same deal, they also tried to contact the driver with no response. And finally, the third driver assigned is the exact same scenario. Same spot, on a bike, no profile picture, no prior deliveries. Only this time, the name is Robert. And before I can react and go about cancelling the order at this point, because I'm tired of dealing with this, he suddenly has my food and immediately messages me the following, Hello, have your food, what's your number? And I respond right away with, I'm not super comfortable giving my phone number out when you can just message me here. And he responded again with, what's your number? Be there in 10. How old are you? At this point, the alarm bells are going off and I contact support immediately to have the order cancelled and get further assistance. I get connected to Uber's safety team who informs me that the order has been cancelled, I'll be refunded, and started taking down the details of the strange interactions. As I'm giving the woman on the phone the info that she needs, I'm starting to calm down thinking that this was just some creep or something went wrong and that's when I hear a man's voice at the front door. Uh, Miss, I have your food. And I can't even describe the chill that went down my spine because of the way that he said it. Making things even worse, the uber safety woman on the phone with me heard him as well and goes, Is that him? We cancelled the order though. I poked my head around the door. The main heavy door was open, metal screen door was closed or locked but allowed us to see each other. I get a look at him though and when he saw me on the phone he went from smiling to looking absolutely furious. He suddenly got right up against the door and kept asking who I was on the phone with and at this point I've started asking him to please leave because he's making me uncomfortable and he's getting more and more angry. And at this point, starts pounding on my door and grabbing the doorknob while shouting to be let in. The woman on the phone is asking if I'm okay. The man is still shouting so basically I'm in full meltdown mode at this point and hurriedly close the heavy door to lock it. The man is becoming borderline belligerent as he kicks my door and the woman tells me to call the police. He ended up walking away from my house about a minute after that and back up to the sidewalk. And for a moment, I thought that he messed up so I finished my conversation with the uber safety woman so she could submit the report. Once she submitted it, I called the police and told them what happened. They weren't incredibly helpful at first since he didn't actually break in or put his hands on me. And they told me that if he came back to call again and they would send an officer out. And I did end up having to call them again and give a full report. Plus description of the man since he didn't end up leaving right away. He stayed in the neighborhood for almost 20 minutes in fact. According to one of my neighbors, after she heard the yelling she saw the man that I described walk back up from my house to the sidewalk. And hop into a truck with another man in the passenger seat. And they apparently just sat there staring at people walking by and being incredibly sketchy. And that's when she walked back towards my house and asked me what had happened. Luckily, she was able to give myself and the cop a description of the vehicle and the other man as well. But basically, this was a 
very bizarre and uncomfortable experience, and I wanted to share it, maybe to see if anyone else has had an experience like this. Because honestly, I'm still pretty shaken up by it, and will be avoiding delivery apps for quite a while after this. It was a, a really strange experience, and I have a feeling that there was more to it than just Uber Eats. So yesterday, I was on my way back home with truck parts that I had picked up and did what I do a lot of times. I opened up my map on my iPhone and started checking the countryside roads for any cemeteries that I wasn't aware of. I go to them and walk through and record audio and video for my own records. I located one on a, a narrow side road and went to the area. And when I got there, I discovered that it was on private property and would be a 10 minute walk through the field to get to it. Not wanting to upset the property owner or get in trouble too for trespassing, I went to a house that was next door back along Gravel Lane. As I got closer to the house, it was obvious that it was not being lived in. It was a huge two-story farmhouse that in its day would have been quite beautiful, I'm sure. I decided though to go ahead and knock on the door. I have seen people live in worse conditions and wanted to at least make the effort to knock on the door. I'm not going to lie though, this place was unkempt and had a pretty creepy appearance. Tattered curtains on all the windows, a few windows had been broken, etc. Nevertheless, I opened the screen door and I knocked on the door. It swung open when I knocked, exposing that the house had appeared to have been quickly moved out of some years ago. Full of furniture, clothing laying on the floor. The kitchen was visible down the hall from the front door and you could see the table was still there. And at this, I decided to step into the threshold of the doorway and started recording with my iPhone. I yelled out hello several times, knowing that there would be no one living there, but still trying to make the effort, due diligence and all that. Within about 45 seconds of stepping in, I was hit full on front of my body with an air so cold that it was honestly like stepping outside in the winter night with just shorts on. It was extremely cold. Now, the outside temperature was about 60 degrees and had been very warm for several days. The house was not cold when I stepped in, mind you, but this cold air that hit me started to slowly move up my lower legs. Now, as this took place, my lower left leg, just above the ankle, began to feel as if I was being ate up by fire ants, but there were no ants anywhere. So I asked out loud, if you're doing that to me, please stop because it hurts. And after asking several times and explaining that I was not there to do anything to the house or the property within it, the burning stopped. But that very cold air remained. I made my intentions very clear and never moved further into the house. I asked the usual questions and panned to my left and to my right, capturing each room off to my sides and the staircase that was directly in front of me. And just as I stated that I was going to leave and would maybe come back someday, I observed with the naked eye a misty apparition cross in front of me from right to left. It was also captured on my iPhone. I was by myself. I wasn't smoking. There was no fog or mist outside to somehow come into the house and move through the rooms. The house sits about 900 feet from the roadway and the door does not face the road so it's not like a reflection from a car or anything and there are no other houses close by anywhere. The feeling that accompanied this though was nothing but dark and ominous and definitely did not feel friendly or welcoming. I have been to many cemeteries and other places over the years and I've never witnessed anything like this. I am a somewhat skeptical person, I like to think at least, and always try to debunk anything that I get. But this one has me absolutely speechless. I will definitely be locating the owner and I'll attempt to get permission for an investigation at some point because I am sure that there is something there. This happened when I was 17. I'm a female and have lived in the same house my whole life. My mum is a private caretaker and used to work overnights when I was in high school. One night, I'm home alone like normal. 
It's around 3am and I was up hanging out and just doing my own thing. I loved having the house to myself to be honest, but in our living room we have two windows, one in the front of the house that overlooks our yard next to the front door, and the other one overlooks our driveway in the side of the house. From the second window, you can see the side of our neighbor's house across the street. So, I'm in my house, walking around listening to music, and I have all the lights on in the house. I'm scared of the dark. The curtains on the windows overlooking our driveway are open, but I'm not concerned at that moment. I keep walking back and forth between my room and the kitchen, doing stuff. You have to walk through the living room past that window to get to the kitchen, and about the third time I'm walking through, I notice a light on the side of my neighbor's house moving. I stop and stare at it. It looks like a, a flashlight occasionally, and I notice what looks like a hand wearing a black glove fall into the frame of the light. I'm standing there confused, just staring at the light and the hand moving near the window, when all of a sudden the light shuts off. It finally connects in my head what's happening. So I run around my house turning off the light so I'm not visible inside the house anymore and I duck down behind the couch under the window behind the curtain. I see what looks like a man in a black hoodie walking down my neighbor's driveway and onto the street. He turns and stops right in front of my driveway. My heart is pounding at this point. I know that he saw me in the window earlier and I'm scared that he's going to retaliate. Then after what seems like forever... He turns away and walks past my house. I stayed frozen in that spot for what felt like hours, I think, and I never saw him again, thankfully. Eventually, I grabbed a kitchen knife, though, when I returned to my room. I told my mum about it the next morning, but she blew me off saying that it was probably the people who lived there and ignored my concern. Lesson learned, I guess, is that I always make sure the curtains are shut from now on. But a weird thing was that whenever he was moving, he looked really stiff almost, like a, a robot, I guess. I never told my neighbors or called the cops either, which I probably should have, but I don't know why I didn't. I guess I just didn't want to blow things out of proportion. But I do wonder what he was thinking about when he was staring at me in my house while I was there, all alone, late at night. As with many, I've always been into the paranormal, but never really believed in any of it, I guess. I have sought out ways of experiencing paranormal things, but any time that I've had something, I have had a way of dismissing it, and could always just chalk it up to maybe a weird occurrence. But about a year ago, I switched roles in the museum that I work at. I've been here for five years now, and some weird things have happened in the past, but again, you could rule most of it out as just coincidences. But when I moved into the collections department, we're the people who take care of the objects and the artifacts in the museum's possession and on loans. Things got weird. Really weird, really quickly. Everyone talks about the museums being haunted, and it's understandable. I mean, we house and care for lots of really old, sometimes even creepy objects and many of them have storied pasts, and our collection is roughly 200,000 pieces. Uh, we have some doozies too. But to make it short, I've been seeing shadows, hearing my name, and having lights turn off and on and when I'm alone. Our storage is split into three areas. The upstairs mezzanine is home to our toy and puppet collections. Downstairs has three connected areas split into two rooms, textiles by itself and American materials and ethnographic or world objects in the main area. And the third area is in a separate part of the museum, split into two, and houses larger objects along with natural sciences. Now, the most convincing evidence I have experienced for the existence of paranormal activity happened about a month ago and it's really stuck with me. To set the scene, I was in our textiles room, lower level storage, in a room off of the main area with the objects, in a room off of the main area with the world objects, returning some clothing that we had shown on our tour. To briefly explain the storage setup, you come down the stairs and can go left into the world objects or right and take a turn into the American materials. 
However, the stairs are the only thing separating the areas, so the stairwell is more like a, a donut hole than anything, I guess. But turning left into world objects and immediately taking another left, that will let you walk perpendicular to the aisles of world objects and brings you to the right side of the American materials. On that right wall, looking out into the American materials, is the door into textiles. It's normal practice, like with most places, to only have lights on in an area that you're walking. So I had lights on at the base of the stairwell, the very front of world objects, and that illuminated enough of my path into the textiles room to see. Up until now, I had lights turn off, door slam, heard my name, and had objects move. Basic things, but stuff that, honestly, I could ignore. I could look past them, or obviously just explain it away. But I went down the stairs into this area and was immediately overcome with just panic and anxiety. The room was cold and there was a, I don't know how to describe it, but just a, a bad energy, I guess. I turned around, sat in my office for a couple of minutes, thinking that I was just having a panic attack and cooling off, and decided to just ignore it in the end. I went back down, hit the lights, beelined it into the textiles room, and started putting things back in place. But even here, I felt like I was being watched the entire time that I walked through the lower level. But again, I didn't think too much about it and figured that I was just being paranoid. But I just couldn't shake this gut feeling of paranoia, I guess. Then I left the room, and that's when it got bad. I opened the door, and... I can see all the way across the American materials. The last shelving unit on the far wall from me is where we keep items from a famously deceased child. The family donated all of their belongings after their passing. There weren't any lights on in that area, but I could see someone. It looked like a, a fully grown man, probably around six feet tall, and the shape was hulking. But they were pitch black like darker than any shadow of any of the room. I'm telling you guys too, with whatever oath that you want, that I could see this person that was darker than any unlit wall. And then, all of a sudden, it sprinted. I mean, absolutely ran as fast as I've ever seen anyone run into the closest wall. Not at me, not to scare me, but sprinted to its right, which was maybe only about 10 feet away from it, into a a cement wall. This all took place in about five seconds and to be honest I didn't know what to do so in the end I just sort of stood there and then I ignored it. I just quickly walked out of the storage, flipped the lights and I hauled it up the stairs. I got about halfway up the stairs too when the hairs on the back of my neck stood straight up and I heard someone say my name and the doorknob at the base of the stairs started to turn. I didn't even stop to listen, and I just got out of there as quickly as I could. Now, I'm sure that there's a way of explaining it. Again, I could have very much just been having a panic attack, but the anxiety went away just about as soon as I walked back up the stairs the first time. Since then, things have gotten stranger too, with objects moving in front of me and other people in departments or doors closing in front of us. Like I said, things have happened since I've been here and there are plenty of stories of before I was in the department or at the museum, but this thing a month ago was just different. I'm only sharing this now too because, well, last night I had a dream where a ghost or something was holding my mouth closed and pushing on my back, and when I woke up, it seemed to be happening too. I feel like things are, are getting weirder and weirder with me and I've been looking into shadow people or other sorts of weird apparitions for a, a little bit now trying to figure out what all of this means. I doubt that this will get much attention, but if anyone wants to chip in on ideas as to what this might be or how to explain it or where I should look to research, I would love to hear any and all of your thoughts. I also wish my best to all of you. So I live with my husband and five children in a ranch-style house, and we've been at this place for five years now. 
Our kids range in age from 13 down to one year. For the past three or four months, there's been something in my house though that seems to cry at night. It's definitely not my kids or my cats. It's something else. These disturbances typically happen between 10pm and 2am. Usually what happens is my husband and I are in our living room at night, watching TV and unwinding from the day. All of the children are asleep because they have a 9pm bedtime. When suddenly, we will hear the sound of a child crying, and I mean loudly crying. Not just whimpers, but big sobbing cries. One of us will immediately jump up to go and check on the kids, as all of my children have had night terrors and typical childhood nightmares at some point. But the weirdest thing is that none of them are ever awake. They're all fully asleep, completely peaceful. This will always repeat too a few more times until we go to bed. It doesn't happen every single night, maybe only once or twice a week, but it's very disturbing when it does. My 13 year old has also heard the phantom crying as she was up late with my husband and I one night on the weekend. Also, my children don't have TVs in their rooms and their tablets switches are always off so it's not a sound coming from something like that. But they're not crying in their sleep either. They're always peaceful and undisturbed, not even moving around when me and my husband go to check on them. But we don't have a baby monitor too so there's no chance of interference coming from one. I do have two Siamese cats who make noises that sound like human voices sometimes, but they're always in the living room with us at night or sleeping in front of the heater in our kitchen, and I've been able to confirm that it's definitely not them. As well as the crying at night though, we often hear the sound of doors opening and closing too, most often the door to my daughter's bedroom. It makes a specific sound because the door sticks a little and you have to put some force into opening or closing it. We always go check on the children after we hear this, and all of them are always asleep. These things are not just heard by me too, but my husband as well, so I know that I'm not going crazy. And the only thing even remotely like this that has ever happened to me was when my current five-year-old was around two, about three years ago and in the same house, and we both heard the sudden and extremely loud sound of, well, what I can only describe as something or someone pretending to cry like a baby. I know that that sounds weird, but it's the only way that I can describe it. Imagine a grown adult almost mockingly or pretending to cry like a newborn. That's exactly what it sounded like. It was so loud and frightening that my daughter instantly started screaming in fear and I packed us into the car that day and we left the house and we just didn't go back for some time. We spent the rest of the day at my sister's and I refused to be alone in the house without my husband for the next couple of days too. So, what do you guys think that this could be? A demon? A ghost? I don't really believe in the idea of dead people just hanging around your house for eternity. A mimic? What could this thing want and, most importantly, how do I get rid of it? Let me start by saying that before this sequence of events, I was 100% a non-believer of the paranormal. To be honest, I'm still in shock of what I witnessed yesterday, but I'll tell you the whole thing from the beginning. So one month ago, in my apartment building, some weird noises started, like someone was doing some construction work on their flat or something. I didn't pay attention to it. I mean, someone just could be repairing stuff. It started on a Friday and it was almost always in the afternoon when it started, ending at like 2 or 3 a.m. The weekend it was the same thing. The morning was quiet, the rest of the day busy with noise, like someone was hammering something. Everyone that was on the right side of the building, my side, was starting to get annoyed by it, mostly because everyone wanted to rest to be able to work on the next day. Of course, we started to try and find the location of the source, to try and pin down this to some apartment. There was also another building close to ours where the walls connect, so it could have been that. But I've gone on every apartment, I put my ear next to the lock, and there was almost no sound. The flat most affected is my upper neighbor, where she lives with her daughter. 
But we thought that it should be the apartment above her making all the noise, even though the water supply is shut down. The same with electricity. So logically, no one should be living there. But we had to be 100% sure, so we called the owner and asked her kindly to open the apartment so we could check if someone was using it or had forced entry. But when we did, no one was there. And all of a sudden, the noise could still be heard, but it was coming from the apartment under where my neighbor above lives. Confused now, we ruled out that the uninhabited apartment was the source. Time goes by, and this phenomenon repeats every day. No missing. Bangs on the wall, bangs on every division of the apartment of my neighbor, on the furniture, things falling in the bathroom, in the kitchen, etc. Police were called all the time, but of course they couldn't solve anything. But they entered this flat, also heard the noises too, but just could never pinpoint where all the sound was coming from. It also travels very fast from the kitchen to the living room and stuff like that as well, which was really strange. Also on the corridor, this is like on the first floor, we started to bang the wooden walls and we would get replies. But more bangs from this unknown source. Even asking questions like, knock once for yes, knock twice for no, but we would get replies. If I knock one time, two times, three times, or even four, I would get the same number of knocks answering me, and it was really weird. Anyway, fast forward a bit, both my neighbor and her daughter went away for the weekend, and magically, the sound stopped. I didn't know this until yesterday, and I just thought, finally, the noise has gone away. But they returned yesterday, and guess what also returned? Yeah, that's right, the knocking again. So I was in the corridor with both my upper neighbor and another from some other corridor chatting. Both her and her daughter were outside the flat, her daughter playing with another girl and the other neighbor's granddaughter. And by this time, zero noises. We were all chilling in the corridor. But later on, her daughter went back inside to pick a doll to play and we started hearing the knocks again. Every single time her daughter went inside, we would hear after three to five seconds, the knocks start again. So I asked my neighbor if I could go inside. She replies, yeah, of course. I went inside, full silence. I stood there like 30 seconds and nothing. I came out and asked my neighbor if she can go inside as well. She goes inside and zero knocks. Well, we asked her daughter if she can go inside again and like clockwork, knocking all over the place and i kid you not this didn't miss in like 10 to 12 times that she went inside every single time there was knocking but later on other neighbors arrived in the corridor and we did the same request he went inside and zero noises the daughter goes in and full-blown knocks everywhere i really don't know how to deal or solve this situation and it's really strange i know but after what I've witnessed, I'm 100% sure that this is something out of this world. I mean, there's just no explanation for why me going in there does nothing and her going in there causes craziness. Again, too, we've had police come and they've heard the noises themselves, gone in to check stuff out and never been able to find anything. We've searched the walls, we've gone to the other apartment that I'm talking about, We've had people come in to try and figure out what was going on and there's just never been any answers. Anyway, I'll update you guys because at this point, with no answers, we're sort of grasping at straws and we're going to call a medium to come over to the building and have a look around. I don't know how that will go, but like I said, I'll keep you all updated. So basically, to cut a long story short, since I've moved into my apartment complex three years ago, I've been experiencing paranormal activity that I've decided to name Bill. Please don't judge me, it's just a way to make the whole ordeal feel less frightening than it is. In the first few months, I was experiencing things like hearing someone breathing behind me at night while in bed or in the bathroom, and also seeing tall figures in the hallway or in my dad's room, I live with him. Bill might also be following me because 
In my time living here, I've also been to two different psych wards for unrelated personal reasons. And at the wards, I also experienced paranormal activity. By the way, I wasn't being admitted to the psych ward. I was there on other business. But I've been seeing tall figures in the hallways or running past a window... The same night that it happened, a patient that I knew was getting medicine and saw a tall figure on the roof, and I felt like I was being watched or like something in my room was going to jump me. But Bill is still here as well, even after I left the psych ward. Obviously, because otherwise I probably wouldn't be posting this, but anyway, whenever I come home alone, I keep hearing things like knocking and scratching on the walls, and that same feeling of being a, about to be jumped from behind. Things have also gone missing, like water bottles that were on my desk, but gone the next day. Things like the shower or sink turning on on their own have also happened. Though, to be fair, that's more annoying than scary if you take into account the water bills. I've also been getting touched in random places, like on my arms and legs, or feeling a, a head laying against my side as well. That happened just last night. And I know that this all might seem a bit ridiculous, especially considering that I named it, but I could really just use some advice on the matter. I've already talked to a friend who's more experienced with uh, spiritual things, I guess you could say, and they're convinced that I'm dealing with a nuisance of a demon, but I wanted some outsider opinions on the matter to see if there's any well, other answers to all of this. During my 8th grade and high school years, I was an extremely depressed kid. My mum was an abusive alcoholic and because of that, there was a lot of negative energy that not only filled the house we were renting but seemed to sort of hover around me. I was stupid at the time, even more so than I am now, and liked to give this negative energy a lot of attention. While I had a lot of minor experiences like hearing voices, lucid nightmares, scratches on my body, etc. One experience really sticks out to me in my memory. You see, I was spending the night at my grandparents' house. I wish that I could remember the reason, but it's hard for me to recall a lot of the memories in that time period due to my trauma. In any case, I was raised for a good portion of my life in my grandparents' house, and so I was spending the night in my old room when I was very suddenly and very aggressively shaken awake. I sat there for a minute, but I quickly brushed it off as me having one of those nightmares where you sort of feel like you're falling or something, but as I got comfortable and tried to go back to sleep, I heard a snapping. No rhythm, just very aggressive snapping all around the bed that I was lying in. At this point in my life, I was so desensitized to having weird things happen to me, I just sort of sighed angrily and went back to sleep. I don't know how much time had passed, but for a second time, I was shaken awake. This time, the bed was shaking a little too. So, I knew that it wasn't one of those falling nightmares. And I remember sitting up at this time out of annoyance and just sort of looking around. I had a nightlight in the room because well, I'm kind of scared of the dark after certain experiences that I might share another time, but I could see everything fairly well. The snapping started again and it came from all around my bed once more. Once again, I grumbled some obscenities and angrily went back to sleep. Finally though, for a third time I was shaken awake, but this time... I was still being shaken after I had woken up for a few extra seconds. I sat up again and this time the snapping noises were louder and somehow felt even closer to me, much more all over the place too. I was really quite annoyed at this point and as I sort of glare around my room I suddenly see something whiz past the front of my bed and smack the tall metal lamp on the left side of my room. For whatever reason, this sent me over the edge and I remember saying some pretty choice words to whatever was waking me up and threatening them before throwing myself back onto the pillow, turning on my side and yanking the blanket over my head to sleep. And after that, I wasn't awoken again. The following morning, I looked around the lamp to see what could have been thrown, but I couldn't find anything. It sounded like metal hitting, so I assumed that it was a coin, but... I just couldn't find anything. I've also had some other experiences in my grandparents' house and my own, so let me know if you guys would like to hear about those. 
But finally, to talk about how this could be debunked, I guess. I have been diagnosed with PTSD, anxiety, depression, and there's a chance that it was all hallucinations. I fully grant that. I also have had some extreme nightmares around this time in which I could feel things. However, in these nightmares, I was always lucid. I'm not going to deny that this totally could have been made up in my head and that it could have just been my own mental illness freaking out and throwing random stuff at me, but certain things just really don't match up for that. Like, if it were a hallucination, why and how was I being shaken by an outside source? Me dreaming could make a lot more sense, but there's two things that don't add up there as well. I was relentlessly tortured in my dreams, physical torture, so why wasn't this dream like all the other ones? Secondly, I was only ever physically tortured once I realized I was in a dream, not right off the bat, and I felt a lot more, I don't know, in touch than whenever I was dreaming. Also, the fact that I was sort of shaken for those few seconds after I had woken up, and I mean, I remember being physically shaken. I don't know. Maybe it was just my body reacting or something like that, but it definitely felt like someone was shaking me. Anyways, I'd love to hear your guys' feedback and if you've had any similar experiences or have any idea as to what the heck could have gone through that night. Thanks for letting me share, and I know not everyone's going to believe this, but thanks for hearing me out anyway. This is an experience I had when I was 16 during the summer of 1995. I was a junior in high school, I was a theatre nerd, and hung out with my two besties, Stella and Chris, a lot. Chris was short for Chrissy. At night, we usually picked up a few friends, bought some beer and smokes at the local liquor store with one of our fake IDs. Then we headed up to the reservoir or local park to enjoy our illicitly obtained goods. This particular Friday night... I was driving my dad's 1976 Mercedes 450 SL. I was buying it from him with payments over time. It was in decent shape and ran strong but was 19 years old so it had a few minor issues. One was that the passenger side door could only rarely be locked automatically using the lock from the driver's side which is relevant later. So I picked up Stella, Chrissy and Ted around 8pm. We were feeling good and extra happy because it was Friday. Ted had to go in the front seat because he's like 6'1", and the back seat would barely allow two small people in it, Stella and Chris, to sit there. We drove to our favorite liquor store just down the road from the reservoir, and Ted and Stella got out to get ciggies and beer while Chris and I stayed in the car chatting. About a minute after our friends walked into the liquor store, an old Chevy van pulled up about six feet behind me, blocking me in. At first I thought it was just a drunk townie being dumb. Then... A thin, pale woman with shoulder-length brown hair came around to my passenger side window and tried to start up a conversation with me and Chris. The woman's eyes were obviously dilated and she said something about how she and her friends were amateur movie makers and she was looking to cast us in their next gig or something. Chris and I exchanged a look and we were both on the same page of like what the heck is this woman talking about. But I had a bad feeling and a very strong sense that the woman was going to try and get into my car so I suddenly started hitting the lock button hoping that it would take. The woman just stood there babbling at this point and she put her hand on my passenger side door handle but literally the second before she tried opening the door my sweet little Mercedes freaking finally obeyed my frantic tapping and locked the door with a loud click. The woman looked confused for a second. She tried the handle again but my car was locked, and now I was scared and angry. I knew the curb weight of a 76 450 SL was about 4K. The Chevy van behind me may have been blocking me and had curb weight up on me, but he was top heavy. I bet that I could do a lot of damage to it if I slammed into it with my foot on the floor, especially if I did so repeatedly. So I said very loudly, Lady, take your hands off my car. Step away. You go tell your friends that they need to move their van now because I'm going to floor it in reverse and tear it into your van like it's a piece of tinfoil. I turned my key and revved my engine. It purred like the sweet little gas-sucking powerhouse that it was. 
and my car swayed back and forth with each rev. I wasn't bluffing either, and I think the woman saw it. The woman's eyes got wide, and she ran back to the van screaming, Go, 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 move. And as she was running back to the van, I saw a thin dude with long stringy hair running out of the liquor store towards the van too. He jumped in the back and the van peeled out, leaving a shower of gravel and grey exhaust in its wake. About ten seconds later, my friends Ted and Stella came walking out of the liquor store. My adrenaline was super flowing and I was relieved to see them. Chris and I told them what happened and they shared their experience. They said the guy who went into the liquor store had just walked up past them and started rumbling about some random weird Jesus and Bible stuff to the clerk. He also said something to my friends about them looking open-minded and gave Stella major creeps when he looked her over. The guy at the counter had just listened for a few minutes while my friends waited patiently to buy smokes. Then the guy heard the revving and screaming and bolted out of the door. The clerk asked my friends if the man was with them and they said heck no. He said that he thought that they were all together or he would have told the guy to leave because he sounded crazy. So my friends bought the beer and smokes and eventually they walked out. Obviously we all thought that that was pretty weird stuff but to this day I'm so grateful that my door locked when it actually did. Whatever that woman and her friends wanted... I know for sure that it wasn't anything good. So the first experience I had in this apartment, my boyfriend left for work and I was laying in bed still when the door creaked open slightly. I was sort of half expecting to see my boyfriend coming back into the room, opening the door slowly in case I was asleep. However, when I peered through the open crack, Nobody was there. None of his roommates were home either and I figured that it was air fluctuation from an open window and moved on. The following night, I awoke around 2am to rattling that I thought was coming from the ceiling fan at first. This rattling persisted, got increasingly louder and then would stop. This pattern continued throughout the night. A few days later, the rattling began again. Still thinking that it's the ceiling fan, I rolled over and back to sleep. I woke an hour late to the door creaking open like before. I waited for someone to walk in or say something, but again there was nothing. The apartment was quiet again. It made me feel pretty uneasy and I woke up my boyfriend this time to tell him. I finally calmed down after some time and started to fall asleep when I heard rattling and when I opened my eyes, the door was shut again. I again woke up my boyfriend because at this point I was scared and sort of confused. We brushed it off eventually, figuring that it was my imagination or something. I have a history of sleep paralysis, so I've seen some pretty scary but unreal things from my bed at night. My boyfriend went off to work the next day and I spent the morning cleaning. Some items from previous tenants have been left in the closets of each of the rooms. It's a sort of touristy area, so seasonal employees and short-term stays are always coming and going, leaving things behind for the next person. I was reorganizing the linen closet, which had some pretty outdated bedding, when some items fell out of a folded comforter. I wish I was making this up too, because it seems so unreal and eerie. Of the items wrapped in this comforter, there was a Bible and an angel figurine, also some Tuscany vineyard-themed wall decorations. I became pretty spooked considering the past few events, so I wrapped them back up and put them in the closet where I found them. I told my boyfriend and our friends about this that night. The name Shelby was written in the Bible, so I was wondering if any of them knew a, a Shelby at all. Nobody had, though. Out of curiosity, they removed the Bible and flipped through its contents. Highlighted scripture was found only in the Old Testament, highlighting the punishment for sins. My boyfriend was reading these highlights to us while I sat at our table near our bedroom door with another girl from the apartment. I heard a quick rattle of our door again too and then when I looked up, I could see the other girl that was facing the door had seen what I had heard. We stepped away from the door and stared in disbelief. Did you see that rattle too? She asked. I told her no, but I've been hearing that sound for the past week. That was five days ago now. Last night, my boyfriend woke me up, 
this time to ask if the noise he's hearing is what I've been hearing too. I listened for a second and then came the incessant rattling of the doorknob. My boyfriend had been reluctant to believe all of this but he couldn't deny it last night. It's getting colder here too so we've been keeping our window shut at night. We're running out of explanations to be honest. He got minimal sleep as the door rattled off and on all night again and it frightened him quite a bit too. We mess with the handle ourselves to recreate the sound and it's definitely our bedroom doorknob. It has the same sort of uh, jingling sound. It has the whole apartment pretty spooked as well honestly but I'm just glad that all it seems to be messing with at this point is our door. So, all throughout my life, I've had weird encounters with, well, the unknown, but this one definitely takes the cake. Visiting my cousin for a night of video games in Yu-Gi-Oh, it was near 10pm and I decided to smoke a cigarette. He joined me outside his back porch area to chat when, while he was talking to me, I felt compelled to look to the left and that's when I, I don't know, felt something was moving over the ledge. It had a, a weird aura and presence about it. I know this sounds strange, but it was like it was ignoring me or didn't notice me because it continued to sort of move along the top of the ledge in a direction where eventually it would reach the opposite stairs and the path to the neighbor's north. But that's when it just stopped. It just stopped and turned itself directly facing me. I could immediately tell that it was looking at me and I just sort of looked back. But being able to get a clear view of it now, it was a, a dark figure, but it had to have been at least eight or nine feet tall. I really don't know how long it was, but then suddenly my cousin said shakily, Hey, oh my goodness, what is that? We need to get out of here. And as he opened the door to the house, my cousin is a big dude, by the way, and really isn't frightened by much. I kept looking at it, backing up, and until finally I shut the door. My cousin and I were in complete shock, but he went to grab his firearms and we waited and turned the lights off eventually going to bed with no other problems. To this day, I still don't know what that was. In other circumstances, were I alone, I would have thought that it was just a, a hallucination or my eyes playing tricks on me, but the fact that my cousin saw it too means that whatever it was, it was actually there. And... It was enough to scare us to the point where we felt like firearms were something that we needed to defend ourselves with. It was scary and it's definitely something that I won't forget anytime soon. This incident occurred in the late 1990s. I was a young American woman living near a, a larger city and one weekend I decided to experience some nightlife with some friends. We were driving next to a sidewalk. It was probably 10pm when a tall skinny guy waved us down and asked for a ride. We hesitated. There was barely any room left in our little red Subaru anyway. But he was well dressed and decent looking so we figured that he had a reasonable explanation. We asked him where his car was and he said that he never owned one but that he once totaled his parents on purpose. We thought that was a little weird so we jokingly asked him what he had against his parents. He then proceeded to launch into a tirade against the auto industry about how cars are dangerous, polluting gas guzzlers and how no one would be driving them in 50 years. He finished by saying that he'd been contemplating slashing our tires he patted his coat pocket, implying that he carried a knife, once we let him out, but we were such nice girls that he couldn't bring himself to do it. At this point, we were all pretty scared, obviously, so we politely asked him if his destination was close enough for him to be able to walk the rest of the way, especially given his burning hatred for car travel. He shrugged his shoulders and mumbled something, and then he abruptly exited the car before we had even come to a complete stop, mind you. We drove as fast as we could, but we all just went home after that, and luckily, none of us ever encountered that dude again. So, 
So this is a quick incident that happened just a few moments ago and has me freaked out and uh, I just want to share it. It's a quiet afternoon and I'm slowly cleaning the kitchen. It's surprisingly quiet outside as typical, when it's nice out that is. The neighborhood kids are running around and being rambunctious as they usually do. I'm enjoying the quiet and finishing up loading the dishwasher and decided to go outside for a smoke. I'm putting my flip flops on and head for the front door. I open the door and then I hear a very, very distinct ma. Now, when my daughter is looking for me around the house, she'll say the same thing with a distinct tone of voice and inflection that I'd recognize anywhere. It came from the back door that leads into the yard and it spooked me because I know that she's away at her father's house until after dinner today. She called me about 10 seconds after I heard it though and it proper spooked me and I really don't know what to think about any of this. Today I share this as a 36 year old man. You'll have to bear with me too as the details of this story are a bit vague and also a bit of a blur but I'll share what I remember. In the summer of 1993 I was in the first grade. My parents had been divorced for many years with my mother having sole custody. As a child I barely remembered my father but he would make his brief appearances or send gifts on Christmas or my birthdays. But seeing my dad always made me happy as I was far too young to comprehend the complexities of a battered relationship or marriage. And after school one day I was shocked to come outside to see my father waiting for me. My grandma usually picked me up from school but never my dad. He had a small black car, a beater. He always seemed to dress nice, suspenders and slacks, hair pulled back in a tight ponytail. I remember getting into his car and smelling what I now know as an adult to be clove. I later gathered that he had a habit of rolling his own cigarettes and gained that he must have been in a, a clove phase. There's a bit of gap in time here that I really can't remember but it's now night time and I'm watching the fluorescent lights from miscellaneous stores fly by my passenger seat window. A gas station I can't really remember, Brahms ice cream at an intersection and more time loss. I'm now running around with another kid in and out yellow lit apartment corridors. Some doors are open and we go into one. There are kids in a back bedroom playing Sega. I watch as Sonic zips through loops and listen to familiar music that momentarily makes me feel safe. But then I suddenly realize that I'm very alone with complete strangers and find my way back outside. There's another gap. My belly is full from beans and burritos and I'm looking down a very dark hallway in my father's apartment. I'm standing next to an aquarium giving blue ambient light that sits on my face. I want to go home. Something just doesn't feel right all of a sudden. In an attempt to comfort me, my father gives me a toy flashlight that projects the Batman symbol. I shine it down the black hallway, the cheap plastic of the switch fidgets and stubbornly slides clicking on and off. My father is on the phone and he's upset, voice raised. I apologize for not knowing what happened next, but I can confidently say that I was safely returned by my father. My mother had no idea where he lived, and he would sometimes drive around at night in efforts to find the mentioned landmarks to trigger my memory. I haven't thought much about this until tonight, and it really made me feel wrong and uncomfortable, everything that happened that night. In hindsight, I was definitely being kidnapped. I really don't know the full extent of what was going on, but... Something just told me that something was wrong. As you may have guessed too, I don't really have a relationship with my father anymore. And who knows, maybe that's for the best. This happened to me when I was 9 years old, 28 years ago now. But I still remember it so vividly. I lived at the time in a seaside resort called Blackpool, England, in a modest four-bedroom house. The area itself was good with very little crime or concern until that night. You see, I shared a bedroom with my brother. We had bunk beds and I was on the top bunk. The bedroom was on the first floor at the rear of the property. My bedroom overlooked the back garden. And one night, I was awoken by the sound of a window lock being tried. 
I opened my eyes and looked towards the bottom of the bed, which faced the four large windows. And to my horror, someone was outside, perched on the window ledge, attempting to get in through my window. I froze in horror, not daring to allow them to see that I was awake. I remember sliding back down onto my bed, keeping as still as possible. I lied there for no more than a minute, but man, it felt like a long time. My heart was beating so loudly that I was sure that it was about to give me away. With my eyes closed, I stayed still listening to them shuffle across the next window. Unlike before though, I could now hear a screwdriver or something in his hand which was being used a little more forcefully to get in. But without moving, I opened one eye ever so slightly to see whether I could make out who this person was. A security light on the back of the property suddenly triggered mid-look. I panicked. Surely now he had seen me. Now he must have known that I was there. Staring back at me was a dark figure, black clothes, wearing a matching balaclava. Only his eyes on show and this horrible, startled, piercing look, clearly having been caught off guard by the security light. He froze and just stared. He didn't move an inch. I was now sat up, equally as stunned, staring back, locked by fear. I immediately jumped off the top of my bunk, there wasn't time for stairs, screaming for my parents as I ran out of the room and into theirs. They tried convincing me that it was a bad dream and told me to get back into bed, but there was absolutely no chance of that happening and after a couple of minutes they agreed to go and investigate, which simply entailed looking through the bedroom window. Nobody was there, they had gone. I got back into bed, still almost frozen with fear. What if he had gotten in? He might be in the bedroom right now. He could comfortably fit into my wardrobe or even under my bed. But my brother, who was six years my junior, had slept through the whole episode and was no use. Looking down my bed towards the windows again, I noticed that the latch on the fourth window, it had been left open inside. Which means that a simple pull from the outside would have easily opened it. I shut my eyes and remember silent tears falling down my cheeks. If he was in my room and knew that I was awake, he might harm me to keep me quiet. Pretending to be asleep seemed the best option, and eventually I must have nodded off. I was woken up the next day by the sound of my cat outside screeching in the garden. Daylight came through the windows, and the bedroom didn't feel anywhere near as scary as the night before. Cautiously, I walked towards my bedroom window, I noticed marks from the window's locks from the outside where the paint had been scraped, which means that it wasn't just a bad dream. My cat screeched again and I heard a commotion outside below me in the garden. Three police sniffer dogs were parading around. A policeman was stood talking to my mum. I rushed outside but was quickly ushered back into the house and was told to take the cat indoors. The look on my mum's face I knew that she was trying to hide something from me. The ambulance, which arrived a short while later, gave it all away though. Apparently, it had turned out that someone had broken into the house next door through the back bedroom windows. The motive? Well, it appeared to have been a simple theft, but the elderly lady who came across the intruder had been found dead at the bottom of her stairs. And the police? They never found out who it was. But then again, they never dusted our windows for prints, as my story was never told. We left the house and moved away within six months. I still think that they feel guilty for not listening to me and not acting differently. Even to this day, my parents don't wish to talk about it whenever I try and bring it up. In respect for my best friend, whose life was... To say the least, a complete mess as a child. I've been keeping this story inside for a very long time. I'm going to be completely honest. I've never even spoken a word to my mother before. At first, it was fear of getting social services involved. Then, after they got involved anyways, I guess too long had passed and I just figured that she never really would benefit any from knowing. This all happened when we were 11 years old. I'm 29 now. It all sort of feels like a surreal dream, to be honest. This feels like the appropriate place to get it out, though. Names have been changed, of course. 
So, when I was in elementary school in Canada, that's K-6, to I was an awkward child. I have high-functioning autism, and while my grades were great, my social functioning was lackluster. Still is, if I'm honest. This left me with a fairly small, very colourful group of friends. Two of the closest being Jesse and Katie. Now, I came from a fairly overprotective household. My mother watched me like a hawk and thus I was a naive kid. I didn't really understand that a lot of the oddness and dysfunction that would come out of my two friends had to do with problems at home. But we were never allowed at Katie's house. I think her mum was extremely overweight to the point of hardly being able to move anyway, and she was embarrassed of it. Jessie's house, however, was only a few blocks away from the school, and we ended up there a lot. Her parents were divorced, and her mum was deaf and mute. My mum and her would communicate through notes, and when I would go over, I would hand them to her, and while she at first would always seem slightly erratic, there were no real red flags. When we first started going there, Jessie's mum was living with her boyfriend, as well as her boyfriend's parents. Everyone in the household was deaf with the exception of Jessie and her younger brother, but both of them had limited hearing. I think for the first year or so that they were there, the boyfriend's parents kind of kept everything from getting too out of hand, but it was pretty clear that it was a dysfunctional household. After they moved out of the household, it was just Jessie's mum and her boyfriend. They would often lock us in the basement too when I would spend the night there. It was a full apartment, so we just saw it as fun freedom. But the one time they forgot to lock it and we walked in on them, shoving needles under the table. Again, we were too young to understand what was going on, but we did understand that we walked in on something bad. From this point on, we would be designated to spend our sleep overnights in her garage as it was furnished with carpets and couches. The issue with this was, though, that Jessie's mum always kept the door locked so we wouldn't interfere with their activities again. So when one of us had to use the washroom, we would have to knock on the basement window until Jessie's little brother would hear and let us in through the basement window to pee. Another issue being, he was hearing impaired. Thus, sometimes it would take a literal hour of absolute banging on that window to get anybody's attention. But we were young and... This felt as close to freedom as you could get, I guess. But we didn't really understand why or what was wrong or dangerous for Jessie's mother to do this, so I guess I just never really thought about telling my mum. And it kept going on. One night, though, we were doing our normal sleepover, playing Pokemon Gold, trading and battling with link cables and waiting for Jessie's mum to bring out the oven pizza she said that she was cooking us literal hours ago. It was about midnight, no bedtime in that household, and Katie said that she really had to pee. She was trying to wait for Jessie's mum to bring in the pizza so she could go through the door, but she couldn't hold it. She goes out by herself to try and rouse Jessie's little brother, Aaron. We were expecting it to take her a little while, but to our surprise, she comes back extremely quick, locking the garage door behind her and latching the lift door. She looks really startled too, she tells us that she was knocking to try and get Aaron's attention when she hears a rustle from the bush next to the gate going to the front yard. It takes her a minute to realize what she's looking at, but standing about five feet from the gate, 15 feet from the window Katie is at, is a tall man dressed completely in black. She said that it seemed like he just sort of appeared out of darkness or like he was waiting for something. He asks her if she's managed to lock herself out, while slowly taking a step towards the gate. As she gets up and takes a step back, his pace quickens towards her and she sprints back to the garage. At first, we thought that she was just messing with us. We laughed and told her to stop messing around, but then we heard it. Hard twisting of the locked doorknob. Then, worse, the sound of scratching metal against the knob. He was trying to pick the lock. We stood in absolute fear for a moment, then grabbed the only pathetic things around that we could use to try and defend ourselves. Then, it just abruptly stopped. There were no windows in her garage and no peephole on the door, so we couldn't see anything. And so we really had no idea what was going on. But we waited for about 10 minutes, having no idea where the man was, if he was still out there, where her mum was, or where that pizza had got to. But we were still sitting ducks in there, and he had clearly failed to pick the lock, but 
who knows if or what he would try next. Now, this is stupid, I know, but we were stupid, scared children. But we grabbed our weapons, which consisted of glorified sticks, and we left that garage. At first, there was no sign of any man. We moved towards the downstairs window and started slamming on it, screaming and pleading for Aaron to open it. Again, that's when we heard it. It was almost a sort of sing-song, mocking voice that rang out. Well, hello again. Three men this time, all in black. The one in the middle had spoken. They made a move forward. We once again sprinted back to the garage. This time, they just straight up tried to kick the door down, all three of them stomping and kicking. It was close to giving in, and then everything just stopped. Jesse's mother had come out of the back door, pizza in hand, and startled them. She ran back inside, got her boyfriend and his two other friends, users travel in packs, and they were able to chase them off with some actual weapons. Obviously, I'm guessing about that because we were still inside the garage, but we could hear stuff. But the adults stayed in the backyard all night, weapons in hand. One person even sat on the roof with a compound bow. Yeah, a compound bow. Anyway, night turned to morning and it all settled down. But after that, we never stayed at Jessie's house for sleepovers ever again. She was put into the care of her grandparents shortly after this too. It took me a really long time to actually grasp what happened that night, but considering they never actually called the police, I'm fairly certain that we almost got literally murdered over some drug debt that Jessie's mother probably had. Literally, I can't even imagine the evils that could have gone on that night if fate wasn't on my side. Something tells me that those three men were way too happy to find children to take his penance and it would hardly have just been a, a straightforward murder. It still makes me shudder thinking about it and I'm just really glad that we all ended up okay that night. Mexican folklore, an archetypical witch is the Lechuza or Owl Witch. It is said a Lechuza makes a pact with Satan or other evil spirits in order to gain this ability. They're often portrayed as older women and it is said that he removed her legs and hide them while they're out in owl form. As a child, I was told legends by my maternal grandmother who swore encounters with witches. Luckily, I didn't have any encounters, at least not until my adulthood two years ago. I was in Mexico in my dad's hometown, a small town of maybe 9,000. Our house in Mexico is uh, pretty far away from the main town at the very end of a, a long dirt road. To the left of the road is small traditional houses and to the right is a deep gully or trench which was once a river I think and on the other side of the gully is the woods. It was around the time of the town's festival which was an excuse for the adults to get drunk and in the town's plaza while the kids played at the fair. I opted on leaving early as I was tired and didn't like drinking anyway, so I hitched a ride with someone from town who lived at the beginning of the dirt road which meant that I'd have to walk about a mile, or close enough to that. So ten minutes into my walk I heard what sounded like birds and assumed the birds nearby in the trees were settling down for the night. I looked at the trees and about ten feet up I saw a pair of eyes, bright orange, staring me down. I was unnerved but pushed on and ignored it. I heard more rustling and looked back, noticing the eyes had gone which led me to believe that the bird had flown away when suddenly I heard a voice from the bottom of the gully. Hey sir, come here. I decided to ignore it but it kept on pestering me until finally I snapped and walked towards the gully to tell this woman to leave me alone. I started telling her that I was in a rush to get home when I noticed something weird. She was dressed in like native attire, which meant that she had a long skirt, but it wasn't all the way down, and this woman's ankles were completely missing. She appeared to be floating. She looked at me with utter hatred in her eyes. I realized that she knew her secret was out at that point when I saw that, and I bolted for the house, hearing a, a large flapping sound following me. I looked back, and flying behind me was... I can only describe as like a huge owl with bright orange eyes. I ran into the house but 
I only had a few seconds of peace before something was banging on the door, screeching inhumanely. I panicked and remembered my grandmother telling me the prayer was the best defense against a witch, which, when I started doing this, it seemingly worked as the screaming stopped. I decided to place salt in the doorways when something broke the kitchen window above the sink, and attempting to come through that window was that same owl, but this time it was sort of gargling, almost, I don't know, like vaguely human words maybe? In a panic, I took the salt I was using on the doorways and just threw it at it. Immediately, it backed away from the window and perched itself in the fence, staring daggers into the window. I sat on the couch on edge all night and eventually... I must have passed out. The next morning I woke up hoping that it was all just a horrible dream, but uh, upon entering the kitchen I saw the glass from the broken window, and when I stepped outside I saw large scratches on the front door. I walked over to the fence where this owl was perched, and on the fence and the floor surrounding it was what looked like blood. Unnerved, I started sweeping the glass out the front door when I saw her an older native woman across the gully among the trees, staring at me. Her face was covered in what looked like small cuts with little bits of blood, as if she had been assaulted by tiny shards of glass. I knew that this was her, and I stared her back down until eventually she just sort of retreated into the trees, and after that I never saw her again. Every time I go back, I still place salt in the doorways and pray as soon as I enter that house. Often in that house, I feel watched too, and other people who stay there report voices outside and stuff on the roof, and in any case, like I said, I haven't seen anything again after this, and hopefully I, I never will. When I was a kid, around seven years old I think, I spent the day at a cousin's house in my old hometown. He lived right in the middle of town so we could ride our bikes pretty much everywhere. This was back in 98 and the tiny place that I came from, everyone knows everyone and keeps an eye out for the safety of any kid they see. When my mum dropped me off at my aunt's house that morning, she gave me some money to be able to go to the corner store for some snacks for my cousin and I. After a while, hunger struck and I took off on my bike to Reeves Grocery. It was the best stocked store in town, and there were only two stores. But pulling up, I noticed an old maroon sort of colored car parked outside. Reeves' storefront had a, a short brick wall about a quarter of the way up, but from the brick up to the roof was all glass. The type of glass that you can see through one side, but is a mirror on the other. I didn't pay the car too much mind at first. I rode up onto the sidewalk and gently rested the handlebars of my bike against the wall. I hopped off my bike and, by force of habit, I looked into the store window. In the reflection behind me in that old maroon car sat a, a little old lady in the passenger seat. She was dressed in all green, dark green, wearing a, a beret hat, and she had one of those sort of crocheted Afghan blankets draped around her shoulders. She looked very, very old. Deep wrinkles covered her face to the point that I couldn't even see her eyes, really, and her skin had a, a grey tint to it. She smiled sort of sweetly at me in the mirror, but when I turned around to wave and smile back, she wasn't in the car. Confused, I glanced back at the store window, and I could still see her sitting in the passenger seat, smiling at me. A fight or flight kicked in, and... I aborted all thoughts of 3D Doritos and Gatorade and raced off as quickly as I could. I didn't even get on my bike in the end. I just grabbed it by the handlebars and pushed it as I ran as fast as my little legs would go. Looking back on this whole thing, the little old lady really seemed to me no harm. Her wrinkled face looked kind and her smile was warm, but my seven-year-old brain just yelled ghost and told me to run. When I told my mum about it a few days later, she told me that sometimes spirits get uh, stuck or have unfinished business so they can't pass on. I remember this encounter fondly these days though and wish that I could have better, I don't know, reacted to the situation. I mean, maybe I could have helped the green lady somehow. So, I know that this is a bit of a strange one, but it's just never sat with me right, and 
I feel like sharing it. So my girlfriend and I are watching a show on the TV when there's suddenly a knock on the front door at around 10 p.m. We both looked at each other like, who do you have coming over? The look between us settles where we both shake our heads and non-verbally say, I have no idea who that is. I pause the show and get up and ask, hello, who is it? A man from the other side of the door says, do you believe in Black Lives Matter? I heard him, but the logic in my brain just didn't. Who was this man? Why was I being asked this question at 10 p.m.? What was going on? I got really confused and asked, I'm sorry, what are you asking? The man, in an even softer, quieter voice, says, Do you believe in Black Lives Matter? At this point, I was right next to the door and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. My girlfriend was behind me. I then immediately motioned her to get away from the door. I remained quiet, turned the lights off, dead bolted the door in front of the guy. What was even creepier though was the dude didn't say anything after that. There was no knock, there was no further interaction, just silence in the dark. I don't know when he left. In fact, he could have been there for hours for all I knew. Also, I wondered if the fact that we had a, an LGBT flag in one of our front windows prompted this. To make matters more strange is that I'm literally the last person to do something like that. I have a historical track record with getting myself into situations and problems with strangers for being too nice, if anything. So for me to get that feeling was really a first and I was all freaked out and my girlfriend was even more freaked out at how freaked out I was due to me never being like that. Anyway, in the end it was probably one of the strangest interactions I've ever had and like I said, something about it just has never sat with me right. One day when I lived in a house near the woods, around 10am, I was sitting on my back porch deck. My dog was with me as well as about three or four of my cats. I was home alone and it was a quiet weekday and my neighbours were gone to work. While I was sitting there quietly on the deck, all of my animals started looking around the yard sort of panicked and startled, hiding and whatnot, like they had heard something coming. I sort of just sat there looking around and listening to see what they were reacting to. After several seconds, I started to hear what sounded like a, a humming sound. Then, it seemed like it was coming closer and sounded more like buzzing. By this time, my pets had ran and they hid and were nowhere to be found. The sound moved closer though and seemed to be sort of floating in the air, moving at about the same pace of a, a person walking quickly. The sound seemed to be steadily moving across my yard, hovering a few feet above my head. As it got closer, the humming and the buzzing became more distinct and I could also hear voices. It sounded like a city of different voices, all talking at the same time. I heard it perfectly clear as it moved overhead past me and the sound sort of faded as it went into my neighbor's backyard. Thankfully, it didn't pause or stop and... It took several minutes before my pets decided that it was safe enough to come back out from hiding. It was a, just a really weird experience and if it hadn't have been for my pet's reaction then I probably would have just thought that I was tripping or something. I felt a little uneasy after that too and gathered my pets and went back inside. I haven't heard anything like that since or before that either. Thankfully I didn't see anything attached to the voices. It was just a a ball of traveling voices floating through the sky. Weird, I know. I've quibbled with the thought of publicly sharing my story for a while now. Recently though, I've arrived at a place where I think the benefit of sharing outweighs the risk. People can be really judgmental. So I'm taking a chance and just putting it out there because, who knows, maybe it will help someone. So, many times I've looked back on the odd events leading up to the scariest night of my life, October 5th of 2015. I'd like to say that I did everything right, but honestly, in hindsight, I should have done more. 
I'm convinced that my son, who was three and a half years old at that time, actually saved me from harm that night. I could have easily become another statistic in the crime database for sure. Although my stalker didn't hurt me physically, it took me months to get past the psychological damage for sure. So, with all this in mind, here's my story. In May of 2012, I temporarily exited the workforce following the birth of my son, Chris. He was born with a physical birth defect that would require multiple corrective surgeries during his first year of life. He was also born two and a half months early, which had complicated things further. NICUs are, are no fun. Chris's father, Aaron, agreed that I should stay home with our son until he was at least one year old, considering the circumstances. In May of 2013, I felt comfortable enough to leave my son with a babysitter, so I went job hunting. I ended up being hired on the spot as a waitress at a small but very popular chain restaurant in my little town. But let's just say too that this little diner is widely known for their waffles and we'll leave it at that. I was hired on to work second shift though, the newbie shift because it's not as busy. After two months, I had worked my way up to the first shift. The breakfast shift is the moneymaker. By the summer of 2014, I had long built off a clientele of regular customers that enjoyed my service and tipped me well. Enough for me to have a little put back in savings, which came in handy when Aaron and I broke up. It was not an amicable split at first, but I digress. I ended up moving out of our apartment with Chris and renting a small two-bedroom trailer in the same town. It was mid-November of 2014 when I first met Ryan, the man who would later stalk me. It was an abnormally slow Saturday morning shift at the diner. Two men, one late 40s, early 50s, the other maybe early 20s, walked into the diner together and sat down in my section. They were my only two customers at the time, so when the older man of the two started making small talk, I had the time. The older man introduced himself to me as Ryan, and the younger man with him was his son. Right away though, by his body language and tone, I could tell Ryan was being sort of flirtatious with me. He even cracked a cliche joke saying, There's no way you work here because you're too pretty and you have all your teeth. Honestly, I really wasn't super amused with that tired kind of humor. I had heard it a million times over by then. And while Ryan was decent in the looks department, I'd even venture to say semi-attractive, I was a little annoyed with being casually hit on by him, if I'm being honest. I was 25 years old at the time, and much closer to his son's age. But nevertheless, I faked merriment because a happy customer equals a better tip. It's just part and parcel to the job, really. But suffice it to say, my fake laughing and smiling paid off earning me a $10 tip on a $20 ticket. But they were only there for 30 minutes too, which is not too bad, I thought to myself. But the following weekend, Ryan came to the diner. This time, and every subsequent time thereafter, he came alone. There was nothing really unusual about this interaction than from the last. I took his order, we sort of chit-chatted when I had time, I kept his coffee refilled, and that was it. But apparently he enjoyed his experience because, again, he left me a nice $12 tip on an $8 ticket. Ryan began visiting the diner every weekend from then on, up until the end of December. By then, he had started coming two to three times per week, and at this point, he really started showing an interest in getting to know me. Now, that's not something unusual per se, I get that. I had some other regulars that I actually developed friendships with, in fact some even getting me Christmas gifts and such. So, I did tell him things about myself in casual conversation during his visits. Just normal things that normal people talk about. But one of the things I eventually told him about was the medical miracle that is my son. I even bragged about the fantastic job his doctors did, showing him the before and after photos of his surgeries. Over those past several weeks, Ryan's attitude toward me had changed. He was no longer this annoying, flirty, middle-aged guy, but rather a seemingly caring person. Maybe, maybe I was naive, but I genuinely appreciated his kindness, and I didn't interpret it as a romantic gesture at all. Ryan continued coming by on my shifts for breakfast three times a week, though, 
and in February of 2015 is when the first strange event occurred, which was soon followed by a string of more. It was a Tuesday afternoon. I had picked Chris up from the babysitter and was heading home from work. Now, where I lived was on a small uphill dead-end road. As you pull onto my road from the main highway, you could see easily my trailer on the right side of the top of the hill. It was sort of positioned perpendicular to the road, and the back side of it is visible as you drive up the road. As I eased my way up the hill, something immediately caught my eye. I could clearly tell that my back door was open. I put the brakes on immediately and tried to figure out what to do. I mean, I literally never touched or unlocked that door, much less opened it, so I knew that something was off. A door is not going to unlock and open all by itself. So I ended up parking my car off to the side of the road and I called Aaron. At this point, we were on good terms and co-parenting our son really well. Aaron came straight over and checked out my trailer while I remained back in my vehicle with Chris. About five minutes after entering, he called me and told me that it was all clear. Again, it's a small trailer. So I made my way up the hill, expecting to have been robbed or something, but in the end, nothing was missing. There was no damage to the door, so Aaron basically brushed things off, saying that I must have forgotten to close the door myself or something. But I knew better. But also, since there was no sign of a break and enter... I just let it go. Two days later, on Thursday, I came home from work and the same thing. My back door is wide open. At this point, I know that I'm not crazy too. I know that I had locked that damn door. It didn't have a deadbolt, by the way, but it just sort of had a lock on the doorknob that you would turn. I had even tested it out that morning before work to make sure that it was locked too, so I called Aaron again. I stayed parked with Chris on the side of the road while he did a quick pass through my trailer. And again, nothing out of the ordinary except my open back door. A quick inventory showed that nothing was missing again. I was nervous at this point thinking that someone had broken in twice and Aaron disagreed. He attributed this problem to a faulty doorknob lock, which made no sense to me. I mean, like I said, I had checked it. He then went to Lowe's and purchased a type of heavy-duty swivel lock to install on the door that locked from the inside of my home. He wanted to put my mind at ease, at least. So, while he installed the lock, I combed through the house. I mean, I literally spent hours after Aaron left inspecting every nook and cranny of my trailer. The outlets, my shower head, vents, my panty drawer, everything. I thought that maybe some freak had broken in and, like, planted secret cameras since they didn't take anything. But I didn't find anything amiss, so I just begrudgingly let it go. Two days after that, so on Saturday afternoon, I'm off work heading uphill on the road toward my driveway. My son is spending the weekend with his dad, so I have the house to myself that evening. A wave of relief washes over me as I see that my back door is still closed. Now, I don't know why I decided to do this, but something compelled me to actually inspect the door up close. I needed to also make sure that it wasn't tampered with. And to my horror, I discovered that it had. There were pry marks along the edge of the door jamb. I immediately went inside and unlocked the door so that I could open it and inspect further. The edge of the door was bent like anything. And back on the inside, where the doorknob met the jam too, that damage wasn't there two days ago when Aaron installed that new lock. I knew that. I deduced that someone had probably been using the credit card trick or something similar to easily break into that door since the way it was locked was by the knob. And when they figured out that that would no longer work, they tried to pry it open not knowing that a new lock was on the other side of the door. I was thankful that the lock held, and at this point I called the police and made a report. They basically told me that there wasn't really much that they could do in this instance other than document the incident. They told me to call them if anything else happened. Needless to say, that wasn't very satisfactory to me, but I didn't know what else to do. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping at home that night, though, so I ended up making the hour drive to my parents' house and crashing there. Now, nothing else really happened for a little while after that. By March, I had been able to put February's events behind me and feel secure in my home again. 
I was working and going about life as usual. At this point, Ryan had begun visiting the diner five days a week. Oddly enough, he was there each shift that I worked, too. It became a bit of a running joke with the other waitresses, and in fun they teased me about having a stalker. I would soon find out just how true that actually was, though, because in April, things got really weird. You see, I came home from work one day to find my grass had been mowed. Now, I usually pay a neighbor to do it for me since I didn't have a lawnmower. My yard was really small, but maintaining it was a requirement of my lease agreement. My neighbor didn't charge much to mow it, and he needed the extra cash anyway, so it was a real win-win. I knew that I hadn't asked my neighbor to mow recently, so I thought that that was strange. I asked him if he went ahead and decided to do it anyway, and he said that he hadn't. So then I called my landlord and asked her if she had mowed my grass for some reason. The lease said if it reaches a certain height, then she would mow it and charge me for it. I knew my grass hadn't been high enough to warrant that though, but it was the only plausible explanation. Of course, she said no, she hadn't mowed my grass, and I was just completely stumped. I then assumed that an anonymous neighbor must have mowed my grass out of the goodness of their heart, you know, like a pay it forward kind of thing. I mean, what else was I to think? All throughout April and the beginning of May, my grass was also being anonymously mowed once per week. I know it probably sounds strange hearing this, but at the time I genuinely thought that a neighbor was just doing neighborly things and didn't want to be recognized for it. Now, on May 5th of 2015, Aaron and I decided to take Chris to the zoo. When we get back from the zoo late that afternoon, we discovered that my front door was cracked open, which was really annoying. But my front door did have a deadbolt, but I must have forgotten to lock it, which was really stupid of me, I admit. You can imagine how upset I was due to my back door being tampered with multiple times back in February too. I just didn't understand why this was happening again. Like all the other times, nothing was taken. My belongings seemed untouched. Yes, I was feeling targeted, but I didn't call the police because I felt like I technically had nothing to report again. But there was nothing stolen or vandalized, just an open front door. So I just let it go again. Two days later, though, I would discover the depth of things. May 7th, 2015. It was one of my rare days off. I was at home relaxing when the diner called me. I answered thinking maybe my boss wanted me to come into work. It wasn't my boss, but my co-worker, Celia. She stated that someone named Mary called the diner asking to speak to me. Mary had apparently asked for me by name. Since I wasn't at work that day, Mary left her phone number and requested that I call her as soon as possible. I thanked Celia for relaying the message and ended the call, sort of perplexed. I didn't know who Mary was, but out of curiosity, I gave her a call. Mary ended up being Ryan's estranged wife. I didn't even know that he was married. She informed me that Ryan had a nervous breakdown while they were arguing earlier. He started raving like a wild man about how my name is a better girlfriend than she is a wife. He told her that we were in love and that he had been taking care of me and my Down Syndrome son for months. My son doesn't even have Down Syndrome by the way. My son is not mentally impaired. She initially thought that it was all just crazy talk considering his mental state. He mentioned where I worked though. He said that we were going to get married. He said that I had asked him to adopt my son. He said that he was going to run away with me in order to get away from her. He even told her that he had started visiting after following me home one day. And when he said that, Mary knew that something was very wrong. Ryan had somewhat of a history with mental issues and Mary was used to him weaponizing things to hurt her feelings during arguments, even if those things are lies. But she said this time was different. She knew that he had started frequenting the diner, and red flags went way up for her when he admitted to following someone home. So, she decided to call the diner to see if anyone by my name worked there. When Celia confirmed this, Mary perceived the possible danger and she left me her name and number, requesting a call back. Obviously, 
My head was spinning at this point. While things were finally starting to make sense, I was still gobsmacked. At one point in the conversation, Mary mentioned my grass being mowed. Yeah, Ryan even flaunted the yard work that he did for me in her face. It was all very strange and very surreal. Basically, Ryan had been obsessing over me for months. He became delusional and had created a whole relationship between me and him and his mind and it was all just in his head. And obviously, he was the one that was breaking into my home when I was gone. The visits, as he said. Why he did it? I still haven't pieced that 100% together. Because, I mean, he never took anything. I imagine that he was mowing my grass because that was his little way of taking care of me. Anyway, by the end of the call, I decided to go to the police department in person to file a report about Ryan. I thought at the very least that this is harassment and I needed to document it. But maybe I could get a restraining order after all. Mary offered to provide an official statement to the police as well, to which I thanked her. The PD took our statements and the harassment complaint was filed. Although I couldn't get a restraining order based off my statement alone. I had no proof after all. The officer did assure me that he would personally go and talk to Ryan. I then went straight to the diner to inform my boss, Chase, of the situation. Now, Chase took this very seriously. Just that morning, a third shift waitress actually brought up to Chase how a man came into the diner very early, around 4am, and this man was trying to get her to tell him which days that I'd be working that week. She told Chase that it made her uncomfortable, so when I told Chase about Ryan, he went back and looked at the cameras from that morning. And sure enough, the man that was bothering third shift for info about me was Ryan. So Chase initiated the process through corporate to get a permanent ban on Ryan from the diner. It was approved at a later date. Now, I was scheduled to work the following day and obviously I was nervous throughout my entire shift. But thankfully, Ryan didn't show up. Nor did he show up the following day or the next day after that. All was quiet at home as well. The officer showing up at Ryan's house to speak with him must have spooked him enough to stop. Weeks, then months went by, no Ryan in sight, no vandalism at my home, no mysteriously mown grass, nothing. My life had gone completely back to normal. But things changed again in October. October 5th of 2015, it was around 8pm. My son Chris fell asleep on the couch while watching a movie. I had dozed off as well until I heard a, a very light knock at my front door. I then walked to the kitchen and looked out the only window that faces my driveway. There's no cars there except for my own. So I figured that the light tapping that I heard at my door was either just the TV or my half-asleep brain playing tricks on me. I then returned to the couch and started playing a game on my phone. About five minutes later though, I heard a few light knocks on my door again. This time, I was wide awake so I knew my brain wasn't playing tricks. So I walked back over to my kitchen window to double check the driveway to see who was there. Again, my car was the only one in my driveway. And right as I go to close the kitchen window blinds, loud knocking suddenly erupts at my front door. And I mean loud, angry banging. I guess my instincts kicked in and I sprinted to the couch, scooped Chris up into my arms and ran down the hallway to his bedroom. I did the only thing that I could think of in that fraction of a moment. He was groggy and confused, but he listened to my instructions. Get under your bed, stay under your bed, and don't come out until I tell you to. I then ran to my kitchen and grabbed a knife while dialing 911. I actually screamed at the door that I was calling the cops in the hopes that it would scare whoever this was away. I positioned myself at the end of the hallway which connects my son's room to the living room. This way I'd have a clear view of both the front door in front of me and my son's bedroom doorway behind me. As the operator picked up my call, the banging on my front door was getting even louder. 911 said that she was dispatching police right away. She instructed me to stay on the line until they arrived. About 12 minutes into the call, the banging got even more violent, rattling pictures off the wall. I thought for sure too that they were about to break my door down at any moment. 911 asks me where I was located in the home and I told her. She asked me if I could hide somewhere. 
She told me not to put myself in danger, and in that tiny moment I felt enraged. Heck no, I'm not going to hide. I'm not taking my eyes off my son's bedroom under any circumstances. Where are the cops, I said. And besides, I lived in a small trailer, and the only hiding place for an adult is like in my bedroom closet. I'd easily be found, so I just erupted over the phone. Look lady, I'm a single mum. I have no man, no gun, and no place to hide. If he breaks this door down, what am I supposed to do? Throw this knife at him? Where are the cops? She assured me again that the cops were on their way and to stay on the line. More banging, but this time it moved to the actual side of the trailer. It sounded like they were taking a baseball bat and beating against the outside of the trailer. At that moment, Chris started shrieking. I ran the few steps over to his room to check on him. The loud commotion had just pushed his fear gauge over the edge. He was screaming, crying incessantly under his bed. I quickly ascertained that he was physically okay, and I returned back to the end of the hallway to check on the front door. As I was explaining to 911 that my son was okay, just scared, I noticed that the banging had suddenly stopped. I waited another minute or so, trying to listen out for any sign of further escalation, like window breaking or something, but all I could hear were sobs coming from my son's room. All in all, it took the cops a whopping 23 minutes to arrive. By then, the perp was long gone. For reference, I live about 10 minutes away from the police station too. 911 even called it a, an active home invasion. I was livid about the response time to say the least. My front door was made out of some type of metal. Just a, a cheap generic trailer door. And it was now completely covered in dents. There were noticeable scratch marks on the lock, failed attempt at the picking of the deadbolt. The siding on the trailer was damaged where the perp had hit it with something, and given the history, I immediately suspected Ryan was the perp. The police said since I didn't actually see the person, then they couldn't arrest him without an eyewitness. The most they could do was make a report. They did end up canvassing the immediate area in case he was on foot since I didn't see a vehicle in my driveway prior to this happening. However, there was no sign of him or anyone around and about. I deduced that he probably had parked nearby out of sight, that way his vehicle wouldn't be spotted or recognized at my home. My home was situated next to a thin patch of woods and has public access roads on the other side. I also am absolutely convinced that Ryan had nefarious plans for me that evening, but when he discovered my son was at home with me via his terrified shrieking, he bailed. He stopped trying to break into my home the moment that my son inadvertently made his presence known. For whatever reason, Ryan always lit up when I talked about my son. He used to initiate conversations about Chris just to watch me dote over him. Looking back, I guess it was his morbid way of bonding with my kids, and I think in his own sort of warped way, he grew to care about him. So when he heard Chris's scream, he decided to not follow through with whatever his plan was for me. I ended up taking a few days off work because I was so shaken up after that. I stayed at my parents' house during that time because I was afraid to go home. My landlord had the damaged door replaced while I was gone. Realizing that I had a job and a life and that I couldn't stay gone forever, I knew that I had to go home. So, I got a gun, a small caliber revolver, but it would do the job. And then I went home. I lived in that trailer for another four months before I saved up enough money to move. It was totally peaceful during those months, with no further events or altercations, but I just couldn't stand being there anymore. Since then, I have changed jobs, met someone special, gotten engaged, bought a house, and even got a dog. No further sign of Ryan anywhere during any of these life changes, and it's been nearly seven years since any sign of him. Ryan seems to have disappeared out of my life in the same manner that he first appeared, just out of nowhere. And I couldn't be happier that he's gone. Hopefully, it stays that way. So, I'm wondering if anyone has seen the people with unworldly large smiles or mouths. 
this has been with me for a while and I just can't shake it and I have to get it off my chest. I know it all sounds ridiculous, but uh, here goes nothing. So a few years ago, I was outside in the backyard with a buddy of mine that was actually staying in my garage. We were cleaning an RV that I had just purchased when my wife came outside to moan about something. I can't remember what anymore, but when she was done, she went back into the house, me still in the RV, went to follow her to see what her problem was, and I hear my truck, which was right in front of the RV, start. Me not thinking about it as I'm walking, I turn and look to see who's in my truck and see what at first I thought was my wife messing with me, but saw a female resembling my wife turn to look at me with this crazy, creepy large smile. And when I say large, I mean absolutely huge, with white teeth to boot, just looking at me. As I sort of back up and get to the back door and walk into the kitchen, I'm kind of back and forth in my head like what was she doing and then I get to the bedroom where my wife is standing folding clothes. I'm not trying to freak her out and myself I turn and I haul butt back to the gate to see who was in my truck. But when I do, there's nobody there. The key was in my pocket but I know what I saw. I know what I heard. My truck started, and my buddy outside even heard it start too, but didn't bother looking. I know what I saw, and I'm just wondering if anyone else has ever seen anything like this.